Welcome to the Infernal Brotherhood of the Scruffy Looking Nerve Herders. Today I'm reading Star Wars Handbook Volume 3, Dark Empire. I'd like to take a moment and invite you to subscribe to this channel and ring that damn bell. Boba Fett, Slave 2. Few things in the galaxy are as tenacious as a bounty hunter with a grudge. The nefarious bounty hunter Boba Fett had a grudge, and he would not rest until his nemesis Han Solo was dead. Fett's reappearance in Solo's dusty old apartment on Nar Shaddaa gave the old smuggler quite a shock. The last time he'd seen Fett, six years past, the bounty hunter was tumbling into the gaping maw of the Sarlacc in the Jundland Wastes on Tatooine. But, as Fett said, the Sarlacc had found him somewhat indigestible. Along with occasional partner Dengar, Fett heard about Solo's arrival on Nar Shaddaa and waited for him in Solo's apartment. But Han and his wife Leia, who also had a bounty on her head, were able to escape. During the wild chase through the chasms of Nar Shaddaa, Fett mistakenly caused the death of another hut, which gave him even more of a reason to bring in the bounty on Solo. Unable to catch the rebels, Fett gave chase when Han and Leia boarded the Starlight Intruder bound for Biss. Aboard Slave 2, Fett and Dengar were able to follow the intruder all the way to the shielded security perimeter of the Emperor's throne world. While the intruder was able to enter with a stolen security code, Slave 2 slammed into the shield and was significantly damaged. But even Imperial imprisonment could not calm Fett's desire for revenge. He would later return to Nar Shaddaa, having broken Slave 1 out of impoundment. There, dark side adepts, Zazam and Fass, attempted to pressure Fett into unpaid service for the Empire. Despite the fact that Fett would hunt the Solos, whether there was a bounty on them or not, he was not about to be muscled by those whom he considered to be the Emperor's flunkies. Fett ended any ties he had to the Empire when he attacked the Dark Side warriors and then escaped. As he fled in the newly repaired Slave One, Fett intercepted an Imperial transmission. The Solos had been found. Knowing his way around the canyons of Nar Shaddaa, and knowing the Solos would escape the Imperials, Fett lay in wait for the Solos. But in a deadly game of chicken, Slave One went up against the Millennium Falcon and lost. His ship damaged, Fett limped away, but his sensors registered the Falcon's passage into Nar Shaddaa's depths. In the darkest recesses beneath Nar Shaddaa's blanketing city, Fett caught up with the Solos as they attempted to rescue Vima Deboda. But Han Solo's loyal companion Chewbacca had hung back in case of just such an ambush, and he attacked Fett tooth and claw. Boba Fett was able to wound Chewie, but the Wookiee's strength and tenacity nearly matched the bounty hunters. Chewbacca tore Boba Fett's helmet off and engaged the bounty hunter's rocket pack, sending him reeling into the rafters above and allowing his friends to escape. Above Nar Shaddaa, however, more hunters awaited the Solos. While the Falcon's twin turrets were able to destroy the pursuers, Boba Fett was right behind them in Slave One. Han Solo ducked his ship into a gas cloud to escape Fett. Knowing that they could not remain within the cloud for long, Fett waited. But when the Millennium Falcon returned, it was with a new lightning gun designed by Impatajoyos Brand. Unprepared to deal with the bizarre technology of the weapon, Slave One was severely damaged, and Fett was left spinning into the gas cloud. Biss. The Emperor's throne world had an elegance to it that went far beyond the staid, bureaucratic monotony of Coruscant's blanketing city. But despite its beauty, it was an entire world that radiated the dark side, a fitting place for the Emperor to stage his return to power. Deep within the galactic core, and protected by an impenetrable network of shields and capital ships, the world was a fortress for the Emperor, from which he would launch his most diabolical attacks. While the Rebel Alliance had made substantial inroads against the Empire's other targets, Biss remained untouched by war. Palpatine had long valued the remote world. It became his sanctuary, a place of darkness where all his needs were met and all his most precious items were hidden. Cloning chambers and armies of clone scientists were at Palpatine's disposal, as were the most loyal weapons scientists and dark side adepts. Despite his clone's rapid deterioration, Palpatine seemed invulnerable while on Biss, and his use of force powers there was more of an afterthought than an exercise. When Leia Organa Solo brandished a lightsaber at him, Palpatine waved his fingers and the ancient weapon shattered. When Leia tried to kill the Emperor by dropping a cooling unit on him, Palpatine shrugged off the crushing impact of a ton of machinery. Even where Palpatine's dark side adepts not at his disposal, the planet was populated with an army of the Emperor's most loyal subjects. Luke Skywalker traveled to Biss in search of the dark power that called him 
across the galaxy and found the resurrected Emperor Palpatine. Within Palpatine's lair and surrounded by the dark side pall that covered the planet, Luke could not stand against the Emperor. Only with the help of his sister Leia did Luke manage to slip through the Emperor's grasp and only after they had left the planet. After the Emperor's death at Onderon, his flagship, Eclipse II, reprogrammed by R2-D2 to return to Biss, collided with the Emperor's galaxy gun. The weapon misfired at Biss, and the rebels watched as the Emperor's throne world was reduced to cinders. Dark Side Adepts Surrounding Emperor Palpatine like a rude cluster of scavengers, the minions of the Dark Side were as weak-willed as they were ruthless. Over the length of his campaign against the Jedi, Palpatine trained numerous Force-sensitive individuals in the ways of the Dark Side. These were the Emperor's hands, able to reach across the galaxy to do the Empire's dirty work. While some were merely yes-men, cronies barely fit to be footstools in the Imperial Court, others possessed tremendous strength in the Force. Coupled with maniacal lust for power, or were merely psychotic, these dark side adepts were some of the most dangerous force users in the galaxy, short of the Emperor himself. Perhaps the strongest disciple of Palpatine after Darth Vader, Executor Cedrus, remained loyal to the Emperor after the death of his clone over the Rebels' pinnacle base. Cedrus orchestrated the first strikes of Operation Shadowhand, the Emperor's campaign to re-establish the absolute domination of the Empire over any systems that had wavered in their support during Palpatine's absence. When dark side adepts Nefta and Sadi began to destroy the Emperor's remaining clones in an attempt to take the throne for themselves, Cedrus witnessed, judged, and executed them. Unknown to him, the Emperor saw this and was pleased with the loyalty of his disciple. Palpatine immediately dispatched Cedrus to bring Leia Organa Solo to him and to send all of his forces against Luke Skywalker. Dark side adepts Zazim and Fast tracked Leia and her husband Han to the shadowed depths of the smuggler's moon Nar Shadda. While their force powers helped them to bully Boba Fett and other residents of the moon into handing over the Solos, they failed to account for Han Solo's legendary Karelian craftiness and luck. During an attempt to capture the Millennium Falcon in the tractor beam of their Star Destroyer, they failed to notice Mako Spence's air traffic control tower nearby. Solo steered closer to the tower until it too was captured in the tractor beam. The beam was severed when the massive structure tore into the keel of the Imperial ship, and as the Millennium Falcon roared into space, the Star Destroyer plunged into the surface of the smuggler's moon. Cedrus tracked Skywalker to Ossus, a wasted world, once a great center for Jedi learning. Cedrus and Vilgoyer met Luke Skywalker and recent Jedi recruit Cam Solisar on the plains of Ossus. Had it been merely a contest between dark side adepts and Jedi, Cedrus might have been victorious, but the Dark Lord had not counted on the strength of the native Isana, nor the presence of the tree-like Jedi Ud Bnar. Dark side executor Cedrus was consumed in a burst of light side energy. Curtis Morty and Zekker Nist underwent a traumatic high-speed induction to the ranks of Palpatine's dark side warriors. As Emperor Palpatine watched his galaxy gun destroy the Rebels' pinnacle base, Morty and Executor Nist traveled to New Alderaan to kidnap Leia's children, Jason and Jaina. Representing the future of the Jedi, the children would be a stunning addition to Palpatine's ranks of dark warriors, but the dark side warriors faced a full assembly of Luke Skywalker's new Jedi, and they were both cut down before approaching Imperial armor could come to their aid. Impeta Joyos Brand, Ganath when Han Solo piloted the damaged Millennium Falcon into a gas cloud near Nar Shadda, his only thought was to escape the bounty hunters that had pursued them from the surface of the smuggler's moon. It was a desperate plan at best. The intensely radioactive interstellar gas clouds were uncharted and unexplored, and their turbulent depths held quick death from radiation poisoning, or even quicker death in the bellies of space-going beasts. Boba Fett was able to strike the Solos before they vanished into the gas cloud, severely damaging the Millennium Falcon but Han Solo continued to fly deeper into the cloud, knowing that whatever they encountered inside would not have such a personal agenda for their destruction. The Millennium Falcon, however, quickly re-emerged from the far side of the clouds, or so the Solos thought. In fact, they had emerged into a clear space within the cloud, a pocket of space completely cut off from the rest of the galaxy. They immediately encountered a bizarre, archaic starship. The Falcon severely damaged, Han Solo had no choice but to surrender to the vessel. 
The Solos, along with Chewbacca the Wookiee and Vima de Boda, found themselves among the Ganathans, a humanoid species that appeared trapped within an antique era of slow-speed space travel and steam engines. After docking on the Ganathan homeworld, yet another surprise awaited them. The Ganathan King revealed himself to be the Jedi Knight Impa de Joyos Brand. Brand had been among the last of the Jedi to be pursued by Darth Vader in the twilight years of the Old Republic. Critically injured when his ship was destroyed, Impa de Joyos Brand was left for dead in the cold reaches of space. The Ganathans rescued him and, combining their archaic technology with Brand's, constructed for him a repulsor lift sphere body. Though the Jedi Knight Impa de Joyos Brand was now more machine than man, he was also still a Jedi. Seeing the need the Ganathans had for a strong ruler, Brand ascended to the throne and kept alive the Jedi creed of justice. Until now, it was Luke Skywalker's job to search the galaxy for new Jedi hopefuls, but Leia had now returned two Jedi of the Old Republic, Vima de Boda and Impa de Joyos Brand, to the fold. Brand was eager to return to the outside galaxy and participate in the rebuilding of the Jedi. He ordered his engineers to repair the Millennium Falcon. Though the repairs seemed clunky, Han Solo and Chewbacca were pleased to see the ship flew as quickly and steadily as she had before. With Brand accompanying them, they set course to return to the rest of the galaxy, but Boba Fett was still waiting beyond the gas cloud, pacing like an act dog on the fringes of the Nal Hutta system. His opening attack was fierce, but the antique lightning gun installed by Ganathan engineers proved to be as powerful, and Fett's ship, severely damaged, was sent spiraling into the deadly gas cloud. Impa de Joyos Brand went on to prove that a Jedi does not need a complete body to become a hero. When the Emperor's dark side adepts came to New Alderaan to kidnap the Solo children, Brand fought alongside Luke Skywalker's other Jedi and defeated them. Impa de Joyos Brand made the ultimate sacrifice later. When Emperor Palpatine disembodied his spirit from his dying clone and attempted to force his way into the infant Anakin Solo, Brand threw his own damaged body in the way and intercepted the Emperor's vile spirit. Knowing full well that his time had come, Brand was still strong enough to bind the Emperor's spirit within his own body. When he died, the Emperor died with him. Emperor's Hyperspace Wormhole Vast energy storms that connect wildly disparate spots across the galaxy, hyperspace wormholes are unpredictable and devastating. It was to the Rebel Alliance's detriment that Emperor Palpatine was able to not only control these storms, but to create them. As war raged in the skies and on the surface of the former Imperial throne world of Coruscant, a hyperspace wormhole appeared in space and made its way to the surface, indiscriminately destroying friend and enemy vessels alike. Witnesses commented on how the storm seemed single-minded, and indeed it was. The Jedi Luke Skywalker was its target, and even as it tore into the surface of the city-covered planet in a frenzy of random destruction, it made its way toward the spot where Luke, having recently ditched a captured Imperial Star Destroyer, was pinned down in a crossfire. When Luke's sister Leia came to rescue him, Luke had grown cold and distant, he knew that a dark power was controlling this storm, and it was on Coruscant specifically to take him. He also knew that he had to go. Leia watched in horror as her brother was swept into the storm. Once it had Luke, it retreated. Emperor Palpatine was very proud of his ability to create and control the hyperspace wormholes, but his pride would get the better of him. As Luke revealed his true standing with the light side of the Force, Palpatine's anger was immeasurable. In a last-ditch attempt to stab at his enemies, Palpatine evoked another hyperspace wormhole over the Rebels' pinnacle moon base. But the combined burst of energy from Luke Skywalker, Leia, and her unborn child sent the Emperor reeling, and his creation, without anybody to control it, went rampant. The wormhole tore into Palpatine's flagship and sent the Emperor reeling into oblivion. The E-Wing by the time the Frytech E-Wing swarmed the Emperor's world devastators at the Battle of Calamari, the fighter had already proven itself in dozens of sorties against Imperial forces. Originally designed as an escort craft, the E-Wing also proved an equal to the formidable TIE Interceptor. Speed, maneuverability, and an impressive weapons array added to the state-of-the-art fighter and a fitting symbol for the Rebel Alliance's new consolidation of strength. When Emperor Palpatine's world devastators began their initial sweeps of Mon Calamari, the Rebel Alliance moved its fleet to engage the Imperial fleet, defending the devastators, 
but the fleet had ultimately been worn down by the forces of Grand Admiral Thrawn, and despite the implementation of captured Imperial Star Destroyers, the Alliance had many more pilots than it had fighters. Once again, a handful of pilots would be forced to go up against the Empire's juggernauts. Had the Rebel Alliance the time and resources to properly equip and pilot the E-Wing, the tide of battle at Mon Calamari may have turned much quicker, but the fighter was so new that many pilots were flying it for the first time as they flew into battle. Further, in an attempt to boost the firing range of the craft, Rebel engineers crafted makeshift relays to allow the ship's triple laser cannons to absorb three times their normal power feed. While the quick fix made the fighters a match for the Empire's most advanced fighters, the power boost could, and did, result in many terminal overloads. On top of that, the advanced level of computer components in the E-Wing proved more than R2 astromech droids could handle, and the Rebel Alliance was forced to devote precious resources to the development of the R7 series, designed specifically for the fighter. Ironically, the E-Wing's potential victory over the world devastators would be stolen away by the efforts of a battered old R2 units. As E-Wings swarmed around the world devastators methodically tearing Calamari apart, R2-D2 used the Devastator's command codes to send the monstrosities against each other, or simply shut them down. Though the E-Wing could never replace the trusty X-Wing as the emblem of the Rebel Alliance, its worthiness, made large at the Battle of Calamari, was unquestionably recognized. Galaxy Gun Imperial weapons designer Umak Leth was responsible for numerous engines of destruction used by the Empire, both before Palpatine's death and after his resurrection. But few of Leth's designs inspired so much terror as the Galaxy Gun. Previously, Palpatine's doomsday weapons were limited. They had to be present at a chosen site in order to attack it. The Death Stars and the World Devastators were both terrible machines of war that inflicted heavy casualties on the Rebel Alliance, but the Galaxy Gun would prove the most insidious of all, because it was fired from the galactic center and its projectiles traveled through hyperspace. It could strike targets anywhere and everywhere in the galaxy. The Galaxy Gun itself was built and maintained in orbit over the Emperor's throne world, Bis. There, it was protected by the blanket of Imperial capital ships that guarded the planet's perimeter. Emperor Palpatine first employed the Galaxy Gun to destroy the Rebel Alliance's command center on the Pinnacle Moon near Dasucha. Only by chance was the Rebel Provisional Council away from the base at the time of the attack. Luke Skywalker, returning from Ossus in the Jedi Explorer, witnessed the moon's destruction. The Galaxy Gun's missile contained a particle disintegrator that sent a nucleonic chain reaction through the planet, explosively changing matter to energy. In the face of such destruction, many systems that have gone over to side with the Rebel Alliance quickly reaffirmed their loyalty to the Imperial Throne. But Palpatine wasn't finished. After successfully destroying a Rebel troop convoy led by the Alliance ship Pelagia, Palpatine's spies informed him of the Rebel Alliance's new hidden base in the abandoned space city of Nespus 8. Palpatine ordered an immediate attack, but the missile was a dud that crashed harmlessly, giving the Rebels the chance to escape. After Palpatine's ultimate destruction, Rebel soldiers snuck aboard his flagship and reprogrammed the Navi computer. A Super Star Destroyer Eclipse 2 was sent on a collision course with the Galaxy Gun in orbit over Bis. When the massive ship struck the gun, it misfired into the surface of this, destroying the Emperor's throne world and ending the tyranny of Palpatine's empire. General Lando Calrissian, General Wedge Antilles The Rebel Alliance was responsible for bringing together some of the most unlikely comrades, but the results obtained by these teams were some of the Alliance's greatest victories. Generals Lando Calrissian and Wedge Antilles could not have been more different, but together their efforts proved to be a significant thorn in the Empire's side. While Lando would have infinitely preferred to be dealing with one or another of his businesses around the galaxy, he could not deny that his friends needed his expertise. Wedge Antilles, on the other hand, was a rebel through and through. Though the two had recently suffered the defeat of the destruction of the Star Destroyer Liberator over Coruscant, the Rebel Alliance sent them both to Mon Calamari when the Emperor's world devastators appeared. Lando planned for the rescuing Rebel fleet to come out of hyperspace on top of the Imperial fleet that blockaded the planet and defended the world devastators below. The tactic proved excellent, and the Rebel fleet inflicted heavy casualties on the surprised Imperial ships. However, 
One of the world devastators quickly rushed to aid the Imperial comrades. In space above Mon Calamari, the captured Star Destroyer Emancipator became a very expensive meal for the unstoppable world devastator. Deciding that they weren't cut out to command Star Destroyers, Calrissian and Antilles returned to the Rebel Pinnacle base, but they weren't to be laid up for long. A former Imperial munitions supplier gave the Rebels access to a shipment of Viper Automaton war droids. While the original plan was to put the droids into action immediately against the Empire, Wedge Antilles had a better idea. Instead of absconding with the shipment, he suggested they ride within the droids as they were taken to the Emperor's throne world on Bis. Once there, they would make a break for the Emperor's citadel and end the entire conflict with one swift strike at the heart of the Empire. The plan would have worked flawlessly, except that the rebels could not have foreseen the Emperor's deployment of his chrysalid beasts, genetically mutated killing machines. While the war droids could absorb enemy fire and turn it back on the Imperials, the chrysalids merely grabbed the war droids and began eating them. Wedge and Lando retreated and were rescued by Han Solo's smuggler friends as they departed Bis. Imperial Dungeon Ship During the Empire's Jedi Purge, Palpatine often needed to transport large numbers of Jedi prisoners. But caging a Jedi was a difficult prospect, so the Emperor assembled the brightest minds in the galaxy to design enclosures that either overpowered a prisoner with energy or provided no possibility of escape. Designer Umak Leth created the Universal Energy Cage, which could control a Jedi prisoner through a variety of networked defenses. In addition to automated stun charges set off by any attempt to touch the bars, the cage's twin repulsor lifts cradled a captive in a polarity field, within the cage. But the worst of all, a feedback system within the bars of the cage reflected twice-fold any energy directed at them. Other cell systems in an Imperial dungeon ship included multi-lock chambers that would present an impossible challenge to even the most advanced psychokinetic, coffin-like encasements where prisoners were drugged into a comatose state, and continuous disruptor emitters that nullified the senses or destabilized brainwaves for extended periods. Most of the ship's penitentiary levels were patrolled by droids, which were more resilient to Jedi mind tricks. The rest of the crew consisted of engineers who maintained the massive onboard power plants and the dark side adepts who had captured the Jedi. Additional levels were open spaces where the dark side warriors would occasionally release their prisoners and challenge them to duels, favoring the dark warriors, of course. Following the Imperial design standards of instilling terror through its appearance, the Imperial dungeon ship was a hideous traveling prison that left no question as to its use. The arrival of a dungeon ship with accompanying assault and support craft was enough to send citizens into waves of panic and spontaneous evacuation, for nobody ever returned once they were brought on board. When Luke Skywalker was called to Biss by Emperor Palpatine, he was the sole prisoner on board one of these horrible vessels. Vima de Boga. Few Jedi were able to survive Palpatine's Jedi purge, and those who did either resigned themselves to lonely hermitage in the galaxy's most harsh and remote locales, or lost themselves in the teeming masses of the fringe worlds and their bazaars, cantinas, and smuggling dens. But the Jedi crone Vima de Boda relied on something else entirely to hide her presence from the Emperor's smell hounds despair. Directly descending from the legendary Jedi Vima Sunrider, Vima Debodo was a powerful Jedi during the height of the Republic, but the loss of her only daughter to the dark side was more than she could bear. Vima Debodo flung herself into a despair so deep that not even her closest friends among the Jedi could sense her. Years later, this same masking would serve her well as Emperor Palpatine ascended to power and began his campaign of the destruction of the Jedi Order. But things were different the day that Leia Organa Solo and her husband came through the lower levels of Nar Shadda en route to Han Solo's old apartment. Vima immediately sensed Leia's power and reached out to her. As she spoke to the young heroine of the rebellion, her mind flooded with visions. Leia was powerful indeed, and Vima saw in her the spark that would rekindle the Jedi. As if following a prophecy, Vima Dboda gave her lightsaber to Leia and then disappeared. The gift alone would communicate much to Leia. A year later, Leia would want to return to Nar Shaddaa to rescue Vima from the Emperor's new dark Jedi who were sweeping the galaxy looking for Force-sensitives. 
Luke Skywalker, who had barely begun collecting his own Force-sensitive Jedi candidates, was overjoyed to receive the aid of the Jedi crone whose experiences spanned centuries and whose lessons would prove invaluable in the coming times. After the Emperor's dark minions attacked the rebels at New Alderaan, Vima Deboda helped to cure Luke Skywalker after the young Jedi Master was poisoned by Imperial Scarab droids. Later, as the Emperor made his final attempt to steal the infant Anakin Solo, Vima Deboda used the Force and attempted to deceive Palpatine into thinking that she was Leia. But the ruse failed, and Vima Deboda was given a glimpse into the black pit of despair and fear that was Emperor Palpatine's mind. After the Rebel Alliance's victory over the Emperor, Vima Deboda mysteriously disappeared. Mon Calamari, Battle of Mon Calamari Emperor Palpatine saw his galactic empire as a place for humans to rule over all other species. According to him, the empire did not conquer worlds. Rather, it saved them from themselves. Such was the case with Mon Calamari, the watery world that served as home to the Mon Calamari and Quarren species. Renowned starship builders, the Mon Calamari were quickly inducted into the slavery-type conditions of the Empire when the planet was conquered. But despite Palpatine's agenda, some in the Empire were not foolish enough to abandon technological brilliance simply because it was not human, even though the knowledge that enslaved Mon Cal's gathered would later prove the Empire's undoing. Mon Calamari's brightest engineers and technicians were put to work across the galaxy. Among them was the Mon Cal who would one day become Admiral Akbar one of the greatest tacticians of the Rebel Alliance. The people of Mon Calamari united after the Rebel victory at the Battle of Yavin and offered their support to the Alliance. Much-needed capital starship technology and military strategy flowed into the Rebel Alliance after the Rebels' defeat at Hoth, and the Emperor's second Death Star was eventually destroyed with much assistance from Mon Calamari vessels that had become the core of the Rebel fleet. Years later, the newly resurrected Emperor Palpatine decided to make an example of Mon Calamari and unleashed his world devastators on its surface. Massive engines of destruction, the world devastators scoured the surface for any usable construction materials and funneled them into onboard furnaces where automated assembly lines would use them to construct an endless stream of diabolical weapons. The Rebel Alliance sent a portion of their fleet, including a captured Imperial Star Destroyer named Emancipator, to defend Mon Calamari, but nothing could prepare the Rebels for the devastation they beheld upon emerging from hyperspace. Nevertheless, they staged a lightning attack on the Imperial fleet guarding the Devastators from orbit and were able to land troops and commence a brutal siege of the Emperor's war machines. The Mon Calamari did not sit back either, and despite desperate odds, managed to cause the Devastators to regroup. But the maneuver proved to be nothing more than a feint, and the behemoths began releasing wave after wave of new, robotic TIE fighters. One of the Devastators climbed spaceward to engage the Rebels in space. The Emancipator was consumed entirely, and the rest of the Rebel fleet counted heavy losses. Even the Rebels' new E-Wing fighter wasn't proving a match for the Empire's newest onslaught. But Emperor Palpatine had made another critical mistake. He had placed the control over the Devastators into the hands of his new protege, Luke Skywalker. Luke quietly altered the command codes of the Devastators and shut them down. Their inside bulge with molten construction materials and onboard factories that were never supposed to shut down once they had started, the World Devastators became sitting targets for Rebel fighters. The Devastators were taken down with ease, and the Battle of Mon Calamari became one of the greatest victories of the Rebel Alliance. Luke Skywalker A hero's journey must still be taken by a mortal. For Luke Skywalker, the journey he was about to undertake would lead him into the blackest recesses of the dark side, and would threaten his very existence. Luke had come a long way since his days in the desert flats of Tatooine. He had trained under Obi-Wan Kenobi, then Yoda, he had confronted his fears and used them to convince his father to abandon the dark side and redeem himself. Skywalker was responsible for some of the greatest setbacks Emperor Palpatine ever suffered, but despite the young Jedi Knight's best efforts, Palpatine's grasp on the dark side and power over the galaxy remained unshaken. Shortly after Grand Admiral Thrawn's attempted reconsolidation of the Empire, mutinous Imperial factions and those still loyal to the dead Emperor attempted to occupy Coruscant, seat of the New Republic. Their original goal set aside, the Imperial factions went into battle against each other, turning the city planet into a war zone. Han Solo and Leia Organa Solo arrived in the middle of the battle, hoping to rescue Luke, but concurrent with their arrival, an energy storm appeared above Coruscant. 
Luke sensed his presence and knew it was there for him. Sending his friends away, Luke allowed himself to be swallowed up by the storm. Funneled into an Imperial dungeon ship, Luke was whisked off to Bis, where Emperor Palpatine was consolidating Imperial power through a new clone body. Palpatine's old offer still stood. Skywalker should become the new Dark Lord and take his rightful place at the Emperor's side. Knowing that his power could not stand against the Emperor's in a direct confrontation, Luke offered himself to the Dark Lord, hoping that, by welcoming the power of the Dark Side, he might find a weakness and exploit it. Han and Leia went to Bis to convince Luke to leave, but instead found their friend and brother locked in the grip of the Dark Side. However, Leia's presence gave Luke the power to break his ties to the Emperor. Knowing that Palpatine would be able to detect his deceit, Luke hid the Master Control codes to Palpatine's newest weapon, the World Devastators, within the circuits of R2-D2. Luke, Han, and Leia then departed Bis, or so Han and Leia thought. Luke's presence turned out to be nothing more than an illusion, for Luke had to remain behind and finish one final task, the destruction of Palpatine's clone chambers. Luke knew that without clones to inhabit, Palpatine's spirit would be consigned forever to the void, but Palpatine was able to transfer himself at the last moment. Within a new clone body, the Emperor was more powerful than ever. After a brief lightsaber battle, the Emperor subdued Luke and broke his will. Together, they would go to Leia Organa Solo, who held the future of the Jedi within her womb, and crush the rebellion once and for all. Above Pinnacle Base, Leia shuttled over to the Emperor's flagship to attempt to collect her brother. Brother and sister fought briefly, but once again, Luke's spirit was lightened by Leia's presence. Telling Palpatine that Within the dark side power, he had also discovered despair and sadness. Luke struck out of the Emperor's clone, but the Emperor's power was vast, and once again, he unleashed an energy storm, spawned by dark side anger. But the Emperor's will could not stand against brother and sister united by the power of light, and the energy storm turned to consume the Emperor's flagship. Escaping at the last moment, Luke and Leia watched as Palpatine was consumed by his own dark power. With Emperor Palpatine destroyed, Luke Skywalker turned his attention to the reforming of the Jedi. Luke began to search out Jedi and Jedi hopefuls across the galaxy. Unfortunately, his efforts would fall upon the gaze of an old enemy. For Palpatine lived again, and in desperation, he spread his power through a new group of dark side adepts. Luke traveled to Ossus, an ancient barren world that was a former seat of Jedi training, and thus a treasure trove of Jedi artifacts. There, Luke encountered the Isana, a tribal people descended from the Jedi Knights themselves. Though the Isana wielded the Force, they had never seen a person with such mastery over it, and they deferred to Luke, offering brother and sister Rafe and Jem to Luke as Jedi trainees. However, Luke's plans were interrupted by the arrival of two of Palpatine's Dark Lords. In the ensuing confrontation, the ancient Jedi Ud Binar was awakened and helped defeat the Dark Lords. Luke and Jem Isana formed a bond during the confrontation. Perhaps the life of a Jedi Master would not be so lonely after all. After witnessing the destruction of Pinnacle Base from an attack by the Emperor's Galaxy Gun, Luke and his new Jedi recruits traveled to New Alderaan, the distant world where Leia had hidden her children. Soon after his arrival, however, more of Palpatine's dark side adepts appeared to claim the Jedi infant Anakin for Palpatine's new line of Force-strong clones. During the ensuing battle, Jem was struck down by one of the Dark Lords while attempting to protect her new love. Luke joined the others as Imperial troops moved in to destroy the rebel settlement. Smuggler friends of the Alliance were able to save Luke and his family, but Luke could not rest knowing that Emperor Palpatine still lived and threatened galactic peace. As the Emperor continued to launch hyperspace missiles at rebel emplacements across the galaxy, Luke returned to Ossus to unlock other Jedi secrets. There, he discovered that Palpatine minions had already been there and kidnapped the best of the Isana as genetic stock for new lines of clones. Luke followed the dark side trail to Vjun, where Darth Vader had built his private retreat, Bast Castle. There, he discovered that Palpatine's new plan was the capture of infant Anakin Solo and the transfer of his spirit into the child. The final confrontation took place on the surface of Onderon, where Luke and his new Jedi confronted the Emperor before he could fulfill his plans. Though the cost in lives was high, Luke's determination to revive the Order of the Jedi could not be swayed, and with the Emperor destroyed, there was nothing that stood in his way. Nar Shaddaa. A nexus of corruption and a monument to greed, Nar Shaddaa, or the Smuggler's Moon, orbits the Hutt's homeworld of Nal Hutta. 
Its surface is blanketed with a maze of gantries, docking bays, warehouses, and trading zones, but Nar Shaddaa is a pale reflection of the glorious city world Coruscant. At one time, it had its bright spots, such as the opulent Duros sector. During the height of the Nemordian Trade Federation, Nar Shaddaa was a home away from the home where all the galaxy's decadences were available, and authorities looked the other way. But as the Trade Federation faded in influence, the Duros sector lapsed into disrepair. The Nemoidians, scattered throughout the galaxy, barely survived, re-emerging during Palpatine's empire renamed the Duros, a hard-working utilitarian species. Han Solo learned much of what he knew about smuggling among the moon's artificial canyons and sprawling towers, and despite abandoning much of his smuggling life when he joined the Rebel Alliance, Han found upon returning to the moon that some of his contacts remained good friends. Unfortunately, other friendships would prove less durable. Han Solo, his wife Leia, and his Wookiee companion Chewbacca returned to Nar Shaddaa, seeking reliable passage to Biss, the clone emperor's throne world, where Luke Skywalker had been taken. Solo decided to look up his old friends Salah Zend and Shug Nix in Shug's garage deep within the moon's bustling Corellian sector. Bounty hunters, professional and otherwise, tracked the Millennium Falcon after Solo announced his arrival to his old friend Mako Spence. The bounty on the Solos had quadrupled since the death of Jabba the Hutt. One of the hunters broke off when the Millennium Falcon seemingly disappeared behind a hollow screen, but another pursued them and was destroyed in the entry chute to Shug's garage. While there was some tension between Leia and Sala, Han Solo was able to smooth things over in his characteristic style. Sala informed Han that the Emperor was hiding every available freighter for shipping military freight. It would be simple for them to travel to Biss, and Sala's ship, the Starlight Intruder, was large enough that the Millennium Falcon could ride along. When Han returned to his old apartment to gather some hidden parts, however, he was surprised by the appearance of Boba Fett. But Han was on his home turf, and managed to escape from the bounty hunter. Han and his wife arrived at Sala's ship just as it was taking off for Biss. Later, Han and Leia returned to Nar Shaddaa in order to rescue the Jedi crone Vima Deboda from the Emperor's Dark Side warriors. Nar Shaddaa was as dangerous as it had ever been, perhaps more so. The skies above the moon were darkened by an Imperial Star Destroyer, and beneath the surface, in the dimmest, darkest corners of the city, vicious gank killers and the nefarious Boba Fett lay in wait for the Solos. As Imperial forces chased the Solos on the surface, Han, Leia, and Chewbacca fought off Boba Fett in the underground. They emerged from the deep canyons and were immediately captured in an Imperial tractor beam. Han's old friend Mako Spence had cashed them in, but Han's reputation for being slippery was well-deserved. He piloted his ship until the tractor beam was blocked by Spence's docking-controlled tower. Before the Imperials could shut off the tractor beam, the tower broke off and been drawn into the Star Destroyer. As the Millennium Falcon sped away, the Star Destroyer smashed into the abandoned gantries and warehouses of the moon. Ossus, the Isana. Once a great center of Jedi learning, Ossus was a wasted world when Luke Skywalker arrived seeking artifacts and clues of Jedi past, but the planet's crumbling facade hid much greater secrets. Luke and his apprentice, Cam Solisar, traveled to Ossus in Luke's ship, the Jedi Explorer. They found a wasteland of rustling hulks and engines of war, remnants of the Sith War some 4,000 years past. Unfortunately, an Imperial probe droid also detected their presence. Emperor Palpatine knew the Jedi history on Ossus and knew that any attempt to rebuild the Jedi would include the planet and all its secrets. Palpatine dispatched Executor Cedrus to capture Skywalker. Meanwhile, Luke and Cam discovered the Isana, an aboriginal tribe living among the Jedi ruins. At first, the Isana attacked the Jedi, utilizing projectile weapons enhanced through weak implementation of the Force. But once the Isana realized that they were in the presence of a Jedi Master, they relented. Luke could feel the strength of the Jedi residing dormant within the Asana and realized that these people alone could contribute immeasurably to his plan to rebuild the Jedi. The Asana eagerly embraced Luke once they understood why he had come. But Executor Cedrus was not far behind. With fellow dark side adepts Vil Goyer and host of dark troopers, Cedrus commenced to attack the Jedi reunion, but they underestimated the fighting strength of Asana, made hardy by generations of life on a wasted world, and the Dark Troopers were destroyed. Cedrus and Goyer decided instead to launch a personal attack against Luke and Cam, but Luke had learned much since his first encounter with the Emperor's dark side energies, and he shrugged off the attack, forcing Cedrus and Goyer to attack with their lightsabers. 
Cam Solisar cut down his former dark side teacher, Vil Goyer, and Cedrus was thrown to the ground by Luke's powerful use of the Force. Cedrus took Jem Isana hostage and attempted to escape, but the tree he was backed up against turned out to be the ancient Jedi Ud Benar, who had rooted himself to the spot 4,000 years earlier in order to become guardian of the planet's Jedi secrets. Ud drew on the planet's living energy to battle Cedrus, and the two were consumed in an explosive flash. Beneath Ud's roots, the Jedi discovered a cache of ancient lightsabers, and Luke Skywalker was now sure that the Jedi Knights would rise again. Luke took brother and sister Rafe and Jem Isana with him to become Jedi, and even formed a romantic attachment to Jem. But Jem was later cut down defending the Solo children from marauding dark side kidnappers. The Isana would later prove to be crucial to the Emperor's fallback plan. If he could not get his hands on the Solo children, his scientists would examine the Asana as potential vessels for his dark side power. The dark side adept Zekar Nist took Chief Akko and the other leaders of the Asana prisoner and had them frozen in carbonite to await the Emperor's personal attention. Emperor Palpatine The Rebel Alliance thought that Emperor Palpatine was killed by Darth Vader just before the destruction of the second Death Star. His death at the hands of Darth Vader was apparently merely a setback, and the evil Emperor Palpatine, steeped in the ways of the dark side, seemed prepared for any eventuality. Long before the Rebel Alliance proved to be troublesome for Palpatine, he had discovered that the corrupting power of the Dark Side had a detrimental effect on his physical form. Utilizing long-lost magic and the science of cloning, Palpatine created a steady supply of clones of his own body, into which he could throw his being and thus rule the galaxy forever. It was into one of these clones, located on Palpatine's hidden retreat world Vis, that Palpatine projected himself. As the Rebel Alliance began to celebrate its victory over the Empire, Palpatine waited while forces loyal to him amassed in the skies of Abyss. With his new fleet, the Empire launched a new series of attacks, first on Coruscant, the one-time Imperial throne world so recently taken by the New Republic, and then with his mighty world devastators. Palpatine attacked the water world Mon Calamari, aiming to wipe out the Rebel Alliance's strongest allies. But even as this new wave of terror swept across the stars, Palpatine had a much more personal agenda, the recruitment of Luke Skywalker, Jedi Knight, as replacement for the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Vader. Luke had sensed the Emperor's return and, and knew that great destruction would rain down on his friends unless he went to Palpatine. Faced with the Emperor's limitless power and immortality, Luke succumbed to the dark side. But even as Palpatine handed over control of the new Imperial fleet to, to Skywalker, he knew that the young Jedi Knight would begin to sabotage his efforts. Palpatine also knew that Luke's sister, Leia Organa Solo, would attempt to rescue her brother and unwittingly hand over that which Palpatine truly desired, the four-strong child she carried in her womb. Palpatine's own cloned bodies were getting further and further away from the original, and thus they were decaying faster and faster. The Emperor needed a new template, a new, powerful body to inhabit and consolidate his control over the galaxy. The unborn Solo child would be that vessel, and Luke Skywalker would aid Palpatine in getting it. Resisting the dark side one last time, Luke was able to destroy almost all of the Emperor's clones in waiting before he succumbed to Palpatine's strength. But Palpatine could not foresee the strength of the light side as Leia finally got through to her brother and pulled him out of the darkness. Together, and with the third force wielder stirring in her womb, Luke and Leia were able to overcome the Emperor with light side energy, cutting him off from the dark side and the malevolent energies he had spawned. Finally, the Emperor was consumed by his own hyperspace wormhole. But a single clone had survived Luke Skywalker's attack. Emperor Palpatine revealed himself as two of his subordinates were displaying an alarming lack of loyalty and attempting to complete the destruction that Skywalker had not finished. Hearing the Skywalker's victory over his dark side pupils, Palpatine decided it was time to test his new weapon, the Galaxy Gun, on the Rebel Pinnacle base. Luke Skywalker arrived just in time to see the mysterious missile appear out of hyperspace and completely obliterate the moon. Palpatine's final eradication of the rebellion had begun. Palpatine could only rule the galaxy while he yet lived, and his current clone, so far from the original, was decaying at an advanced rate. He needed fresh genetic stock, strong in the force, with which he could create a new endless source of clones. Of course, there was no better candidates than the children of Luke Skywalker's sister, Leia Organa Solo. Palpatine had already felt the strength of the child within Leia's womb when she and Luke had united in light to drive back the power of the dark side. 
Palpatine dispatched his dark side adepts to New Alderaan to steal away the young twins, Jason and Jaina, but they were repulsed and destroyed by the Jedi candidate Luke Skywalker had already found. The rebels had once again slipped through his grasp. The Emperor continued his galaxy gun attacks, but it was becoming more and more obvious that his clone body could not live much longer. Without a new body, he would be resigned to the utter madness beyond death. Palpatine traveled to Korriban, the hidden world crypt of the Sith Lords and Palpatine's private place of power. Here, among the vaults containing the mortal remains of Sith Lords, Palpatine would ask for the Sith Lords' spirit's help in halting the decay of his flesh. Instead, the spirits fed him a vision of the infant Anakin Solo. Palpatine would have to transfer his spirit into the child. Journeying to Onderon, where Leia Organa Solo had taken sanctuary among the Beast Riders, Palpatine disguised himself as a pilgrim and crept inside to confront the mother and child. Leia had grown strong in the Force under the tutelage of her brother, and she repulsed Palpatine's attacks, weakening his body considerably. But Palpatine's resolve was powerful enough to fight back, and as Luke Skywalker's Jedi trainees filed in to protect the infant Anakin, Palpatine cut them down. In a final bid, Palpatine reached out to grasp Anakin, but was shot down by Anakin's father, Han. As his spirit rose from his body and shot toward the defenseless child, the Jedi Impetijoyos brand, mortally wounded during the battle, intercepted it and took Palpatine within himself. As Brand died, he took Palpatine with him, and the once great emperor of a million worlds was no more. R2-D2, C-3PO in the valiant struggle for freedom, the Rebel Alliance has relied on heroes of all species, but two of its greatest heroes were not living beings at all. Having proved themselves more than worthy on a number of occasions, R2-D2 and C-3PO would prove very valuable to the Rebel Alliance in the dark days following the return of Emperor Palpatine. When Luke Skywalker was consumed by the Emperor's hyperspace wormhole during the Battle of Coruscant, R2-D2 was by his master's side. Skywalker's falling into the clutches of this enemy proved quite perplexing to the little droid, but R2 remained faithful, even when Skywalker's efforts seemed to be directed against the Rebel Alliance and when Skywalker seemingly erased R2's memory banks. Han and Leia Solo, along with Han's friends Shug and Sala, made a daring rescue attempt, infiltrating the Emperor's throne world and spiriting away Luke and R2. While Luke himself turned out to be an illusion, R2, his memory banks restored, slipped away with the rescuers. Luke had encoded the command control codes for Emperor Palpatine's world devastators within R2. The spirited droid had once before carried the Emperor's secrets into the hands of the Rebel Alliance, allowing them to find a crucial weakness in the Death Star. This time, the world devastators would be simply shut down. When the Rebel Alliance sent a task force to the Emperor's throne world within a shipment of Viper Automaton battle droids, R2 and 3PO went along with them. R2's experience with Imperial computers was invaluable, and 3PO would be needed to translate raw data on the Imperial forces. Though the plan was foiled by the introduction of the Emperor's chrysalid beasts, the droids aided in the Rebels' escape and unwittingly caused the destruction of the primary defense system of the Emperor's citadel. Later within the Rebel Alliance's new hidden base in the abandoned space city of Nespus 8, 3PO and R2 discovered a spy among the Rebels, giving the Alliance the opportunity to escape from an imminent attack by the Emperor's galaxy gun. When the Emperor attempted to kidnap Leia Organa Solo's children himself, 3PO threw himself between Palpatine and the children, buying precious time for the Jedi to regroup and attack the Emperor. Finally, R2-D2, taken along on a mission to infiltrate the Emperor's flagships, rerouted the ship's command and instructed the Navi computer to send the ship back to Biss, where it collided with the galaxy gun and caused the destruction of the entire planet. The strength of the Rebel Alliance, and ultimately the New Republic, flowed from its diversity, and the leaders of the Alliance recognized the heroism of all its devotees, including droids. Indeed, some believed that the droids themselves should be granted all the freedoms of citizenship enjoyed by members of the New Republic. Salah's End, Shug Nix When Emperor Palpatine returned, even those who tried their best to avoid the galactic conflict could not just wait for one side or the other to win, and when the Emperor's minions came after one of their friends, Salah's End and Shug Nix responded ferociously. It's not like they had a choice. Han Solo arrived at Nix's spacer garage with a bounty hunter on his tail. 
By shooting down the hunter, Nix incurred the wrath of the Huts, who had quadrupled their bounties on Han and Leia Solo since the death of Jabba the Hutt. The Solos needed a ship that could make a deep core run, which could take them to Biss in an attempt to rescue Luke Skywalker. Han's old girlfriend, Sala Zend, had just the ship, the Starlight Intruder. With just a few modifications, the freighter could carry them all to Biss along with the Millennium Falcon. Barely escaping from Boba Fett, the Starlight Intruder made the jump to light speed on its way to Biss. Fett was in pursuit until the Intruder passed through the Biss security perimeter and onward to the surface. Once on Biss, the Intruder had legitimate business. The Emperor was hiring all available transports for shipping weaponry, but that didn't matter to Sala's end. When her old lover and his wife took the Millennium Falcon to the Emperor's Citadel, Sala and Shug hid on board. After Leia, Han, C-3PO, and Chewbacca disembarked, Sala took the controls of the ship and blasted away out of the dock, hiding the Falcon in the immense hold of fellow smuggler Lo Khan's hyperspace marauder. Later, when Han and Leia had accomplished their mission, Sala and Shug went to fetch them in the Falcon. But the wanted ship was discovered by an Imperial hunter-killer droid, which tractor-beamed them into its holding area. But Shug Nix hadn't earned the reputation of being one of the galaxy's best electronic techs by sitting idle. Within the hunter-killer, Shug burrowed into the control computer and took control of the massive droid. Using it to punch through the prison walls where their friends were being held, the smugglers merited the attention of the local security detail. As the Millennium Falcon burst from the droid's holding area, the hunter-killer turned on its own security forces, providing a chance for the Falcon to escape. Salazend had lost her prized ship, but the Rebel Alliance was always good for its debts. Rebel Alliance The alliance against the Empire of Palpatine had come a long way since the destruction of the second Death Star over Endor, but when Palpatine resurrected himself and once again took control over his empire, his enemy was still scattered and unable to fully control the galaxy. Though they would later be able to name themselves the New Republic, for now they were a provisional ruling council, that Mon Mothma, Admiral Akbar, Leia Organa Solo, and others were strong enough to shape a new era of freedom from the decks of myriad ships, and in the midst of battles is testament to their strength and righteousness as rulers of a free galaxy. During the Emperor's absence, Imperial loyalists were able to maintain a death-like grip on many galactic systems. As the rebel leaders began coping with maintenance and leadership of the galaxy, their efforts were constantly interrupted by marauding Imperial warlords. As it turned out, this was a diversion to keep the Rebel Alliance off balance until Palpatine could return and reclaim his newly consolidated empire. Shortly after Grand Admiral Thrawn's defeat, the Emperor's ruling circle saw their opportunity to strike at the exhausted rebels and took it. The former Imperial throne world Coruscant had been converted over to rebel leadership. Years of losing, regaining, and losing the world again had taken their toll, and the once stunning vistas of Coruscant were as often tainted with vast wastelands of battlefield. Once again, Coruscant fell under imperial control, but mutinous imperials clashed with Palpatine's loyalists, and the planet was ravaged by civil strife. The Rebel Alliance was able to once again step in and take the world, but they knew that this could not continue. The Rebel Provisional Council escaped to the pinnacle moon of Desucha. Mon Mothma's plan had been to use the template of the Old Republic to construct a new Republic, but she failed to realize that much of the strength of the Old Republic had come from a steadfast foundation of justice provided by the Jedi Knights. It therefore became the Rebel Alliance's top priority to assist Luke Skywalker in rebuilding the Jedi Order. Sure enough, one of the Alliance's efforts on behalf of the Jedi became apparent. The newly resurrected Emperor Palpatine took notice, and his own agenda to destroy the Jedi seemed to distract him enough that the Rebel Alliance could continue their efforts to dismantle the Empire. After the Emperor's humiliating defeat at Mon Calamari, where his world devastators had failed after Luke Skywalker's espionage, Palpatine turned his attentions once again to the rebel leadership, who had so boldly gotten behind Skywalker's attempt to rebuild the Jedi. With his new galaxy gun, Palpatine made a decisive stroke at the heart of the rebel alliance, firing the weapon at the rebels' provisional headquarters on the Pinnacle Moon. Though the base and the entire moon were completely destroyed, the Rebel Provisional Council has made their escape. In response, the Rebels launched a personal attack at the Emperor's cloning facility on Biss. The Emperor was suitably enraged, but the Rebel Alliance was on the run once again. The Rebels took shelter in the abandoned space city of Nespus 8, a vast space-going hub abandoned since the days of the Old Republic. 
There, Leia Organa Solo gave birth to her third child, Anakin. Shortly afterward, Palpatine's agents discovered the Rebel Alliance's location, and Palpatine fired his galaxy gun once more. But the first missile was a dud and crashed harmlessly into the station, giving the Rebels a chance to escape. As the second missile struck its target and exploded with ferocious energy, the Rebel fleet jumped into hyperspace. After the destruction of the Emperor and his throne world, the Rebel fleet returned to Coruscant to take possession and begin the long, arduous task of rebuilding. Here, the Rebel Alliance officially became known as the New Republic, under the leadership of Mon Mothma as Chief of State and Leia Organa Solo as Minister of State. The Starlight Intruder Though some starships are indelibly recorded in the annals of the Galactic Civil War as significant participants in historic events, other ships operated quietly behind the scenes and carved out impressive records all their own. For a smuggler like Sala Zend, operating beneath official notice was all that she desired. But Sala's Starlight Intruder was destined for other things. Sala had been designing the ship for six years and had recently acquired Imperial Clearance as a free agent hauler, when Sala's old boyfriend Han Solo returned to Nar Shadda and brought with him a trail of bounty hunters and Imperial notice. Though Sala savored the idea of a distinctly non-regulation vessel operating legally for the Empire, and savored the credits that would have come with that even more, the Starlight Intruder was pressed into Rebel service. The Empire was hiring all available freighters to make deep core runs to the Emperor's throne world, Vis. Han and his wife, Leia, had been charged with the task of traveling to Biss and rescuing Luke Skywalker from Emperor Palpatine. While Han and Leia avoided capture by Nar Shaddaa's indigenous bounty hunters, Salazen had the Millennium Falcon attached to the Starlight Intruder's hull. Once on the planet, the Millennium Falcon carries the Solos away to search for Luke. Imperial authorities were unable to capture the Falcon, but the Starlight Intruder was impounded. Sala later learned with disappointment that the ship had been scrapped, but had already carried over many of the Starlight Intruder's modifications to a new ship that would prove just as valuable to the Rebel Alliance, Salvager III. World Devastators Emperor Palpatine returned to his empire to find it a very different place. Previously, the empire drew on thousands of worlds to stock its ranks with the best and brightest, an army spanning the stars. Years later, the empire fragmented, Palpatine realized that he would need to utilize his resources more selectively. To do so, he would utilize his enemies' resources. Palpatine unleashed the World Devastators. Designed by Umak Leth, an Imperial engineer who had assisted Palpatine since the Jedi Purge with such devices as the Universal Energy Cage, the World Devastator used an opponent's energy and resources to build Imperial machines of war. Powered by miniature black holes, World Devastators were heavily armored, portable processing plants. A vast mouth at one end swallowed structures, weapons, and any raw material into molecular furnaces within the belly of the mechanical monster. The material was broken down and supplied to numerous automated factories, which produced devastating weapons of war based on a library of plans. Suddenly, the Emperor's primary means of instilling fear in citizens was not simply destructive, it was a builder of nightmares that stole from the planet in order to move to the next. The first full-scale test of the horrific machines took place on Mon Calamari, the world whose citizens had rallied around the Alliance flag late in the Galactic Civil War. Mon Calamari's participation arguably turned the tide against the Empire during the Battle of Endor. Years later, Palpatine would make an example of them. Rebel forces swarmed around the world devastators, but attack seemed futile against the armored behemoths. As the attack progressed, the internal factories began producing vicious new weapons, including the TIE D, a robotic fighter capable of outflying and outgunning any Alliance vessel. It was not until Luke Skywalker hid the master control codes for the World Devastators in R2-D2's circuits that the Rebel Alliance had a chance against the Emperor's mightiest weapon of war. Once the kilometer-long vessels were shut down, however, it was a simple matter for Alliance soldiers to take them over and destroy them. Leia Organa Solo, the Solo family. In her own way, the sister of Luke Skywalker was more powerful than her brother, or even their father, the Jedi Anakin Skywalker, who became the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Vader. For it was within Leia to give birth to the children who would one day become the new generation of Jedi and return light and freedom to the galaxy. 
Her brother had taught her much since the fateful day when she discovered the Jedi legacy within her own blood, but now, with her children Jason and Jaina on their way to become great Jedi in their own right, and a third Force-strong child within her womb, Leia would have to address her link to the Force, and quickly. Though war raged on across the galaxy, life had to continue. Even for Princess Leia Organa Solo, diplomat, warrior, figurehead of the Rebel Alliance, this maxim held true. With her husband, one-time smuggler extraordinaire Han Solo, Leia built a family, but their timing could not have been worse. Leia knew that the twins, Jason and Jaina, were the future of the Jedi Order. Her brother Luke had envisioned it. Vima Deboda had foreseen it. Even the resurrected Emperor Palpatine, eager to expand the ranks of his dark side warriors, had foreseen it. Thus the children, barely old enough to speak, became a treasure worth ravaging a galaxy for. Leia had her children hidden in the remote world codenamed New Alderaan, under the care of Leia's lifelong friend Winter. The children would, would be raised in relative isolation from the war, raging just a few systems away. Leia and her husband also felt the need to strengthen the family ties with her brother, Luke. More and more, Luke was becoming introspective, his thoughts dwelling on their father, Anakin Skywalker, and the dark side specter he had been trapped within for so many years. Afraid that the dark side was becoming more and more appealing to the young Jedi, Leia rushed to join Luke when Coruscant became the battleground for former Imperial warlords and those who had remained faithful to Emperor Palpatine's empire. Luke's Star Destroyer had crashed to the surface during the fighting, but no sooner had Han and Leia discovered Luke among the crossfire than a bizarre energy storm appeared out of hyperspace and sped toward the surface. Her Force abilities strengthened by her training with her brother, Leia was able to help, but her brother decided that the storm was here to collect him, and he was compelled to go. Leia tracked her brother to Biss, the new throne world of the resurrected Palpatine. Luke had apparently gone over to the dark side, his will unable to withstand the Emperor's power. Her arrival on Biss was welcome news to Palpatine, who immediately called her in front of him. With both of Vader's children under his control, Palpatine's empire would be unstoppable. But Leia's will, buoyed by Han's Carillion's stubborn streak and her own Skywalker anger, kept her from buckling under Palpatine's dark invitation. Catching the Emperor off guard, Leia threw him to the ground and snatched up a Jedi holocron as she made her escape. Confronting Luke, Leia asked him to come with them. Luke explained his plan of defeating the Emperor by secreting the plans for his new war machines in R2-D2. Leia was overjoyed when Luke decided to accompany them off Biss, but once they were airborne, Luke turned out to be nothing more than a Jedi illusion. He remained behind on Biss to wait for his chance to destroy the Emperor. When Leia next saw her brother again, his plans for the destruction of Palpatine had failed, and Palpatine now resided in one of his own clones, much younger and stronger. Above the Rebel Pinnacle base, the Emperor's Eclipse Star Destroyer appeared out of hyperspace. Palpatine broadcasted to the surface he wanted Leia, and he wanted his holocron. After that, he was prepared to discuss a truce with the Rebels. Leia could not resist her final opportunity to rescue her brother. Indeed, her words swayed him, and he turned on the Emperor. In his anger, the Emperor loosed another energy storm on the Rebel fleet, but Palpatine's dark side powers could not stand against Luke and Leia's powers together, augmented by the Force-strong child in Leia's womb. Bathed in light side energies, Palpatine lost control of the energy storm outside. Leia and her brother escaped from Palpatine's flagship as it was consumed by the energy storm. With the Emperor supposedly destroyed, Leia returned to her diplomatic duties among the Rebel Alliance command. Her husband, Han Solo, still dealt with a bounty over his head. Despite that, he once again returned to Nar Shaddaa in hopes of finding the Jedi crone Vima Deboda, who had proven viable in Luke Skywalker's plan to revive the Jedi. Jedi Holocron Relics of enormous age and stunning power, the Jedi Holocrons were once a time-honored teaching device among the Jedi, allowing students to learn from the great Jedi who had passed before them. The genesis of the holocrons was lost in time, but the undeniable power of the small cubes made them some of the most highly sought-after relics. Thus, when Palpatine finally found one, it became one of his most prized possessions, and he learned much from its limitless store of knowledge. It was information that he would use against the Jedi. When Luke Skywalker and his sister Leia eventually came to him, Palpatine brandished the holocron as if to crush the Jedi hopeful's dreams by showing them the power the Jedi once had, and the power that he alone had subjugated and, eventually, all but snuffed out. But Palpatine failed to reckon with Leia's willpower, and in a moment of weakness, she disabled him and stole the holocron. 
In her first interaction with the holocron, Leia knew that despite Palpatine's long years spent with the device, he had failed to extract the deepest pieces of knowledge, locked away within the holocron's core and accessible only by force-strong individuals steeped in the light side. The holocron recognized Leia as such and opened up to her as it never had for Palpatine. Thus, while Luke Skywalker scoured the galaxy looking for Jedi hopefuls, or the rare force strong beings who had escaped the Emperor's Jedi purge, Leia herself added immeasurably to the effort to revive the Jedi. The holocron contained the teachings of the Jedi Master Bodo Boss. Leia learned much from Bodo Boss as her brother attempted to penetrate the mysteries of the dark side more directly. Boss, a powerful Jedi from the Old Republic, related to her story of Ulic Keldroma's quest to learn more of the Dark Side's secrets and how it destroyed everything in his life before it destroyed him. Through the teachings of Bodo Boss, Leia knew that she needed to return to her brother, and together they would return to the light. Star Wars Dark Empire Promotional Art, 1990 by Cam Kennedy Star Wars Dark Empire, published in 1990-1991, was Dark Horse Comics' very first Star Wars publication. Each issue ended with a lengthy text piece fleshing out the world and backstory of Dark Empire as Lucasfilm and Dark Horse saw it at the time. Though some of these ideas have been superseded by later Star Wars comic books and novels, they're presented here as a record for the creators' original world-building plans. Star Wars Dark Empire No. 1 From a Time of Peace to a Time of Darkness it is now six years since the Battle of Endor when the Rebel Alliance successfully destroyed the second Death Star, and Darth Vader, the Emperor, met their fates. In the months immediately following the decisive victory, there was a joyous uprising throughout the galaxy. The Emperor's tyrannical bureaucracy collapsed and the Imperial fleet was forced to retreat among the planetary systems still firmly under its military control. The Rebel Alliance, guided by Mon Mothma, then announced the establishment of a new republic. Its provisional seat of government was to be Coruscant the ruling world and the imperial system. It was a time of peace and celebration. Unfortunately, as things developed, the peace was short-lived, and the new confederation proved to be a fragile one. Soon after, the imperials, in cooperation with the emperor's ruling circle, managed to consolidate control over roughly a fourth of the galaxy. Whole systems became fortresses bristling with firepower. Mon Mothma, for her part, seemed determined to model the new republic on the old, ignoring the obvious fact that the stability of the old republic had depended on the now extinct warrior society of Jedi Knights. So it was that a brief period of celebration was followed by years of struggle. The now infamous Grand Admiral Thrawn, last of the Emperor's powerful warlords, mounted a deft assault on the fledgling republic. Others followed his lead, and production of war technologies expanded rapidly on all the Imperial worlds. The Alliance very quickly found itself on the defensive, as the Imperials gradually regained strength, pushing back on the Alliance until the, major until the majority of worlds, including the vital Imperial system, fell once again under Imperial control. For a time, it looked as if the new Empire was about to emerge from the ashes of the old, but that very possibility triggered a power struggle of immense proportions. Who would sit in the Emperor's throne? Who had the right and the might? The question was no sooner asked than it was answered, with violence. Powerful admirals and fleet commanders took up arms against each other and against the Emperor's ruling circle in ferocious contention for control of the Empire. The Alliance Seizes the Day The mutinous strife among Imperials was a golden opportunity for the beleaguered Alliance. Using all the resources at their disposal, the rebels delivered stinging blows against the feudal, feuding armies. Star Destroyers, captured in the Battle of Endor, conducted highly effective hit-and-run sorties into the war zones, sowing chaos and confusion among all the warring factions. As our story opens amidst the chaos of civil war, old friends have fallen, and other old friends are on a mission of rescue. These are the brave fighters of the Re Rebel Alliance, their friendships forged during the endless struggle for freedom. Over the years, they have become battle-hardened, perhaps, but they've also grown wise in the ways of the heart. The Force is strong in your family. In the peaceful months after the Battle of Endor, Han Solo and Princess Leia Organa were married, and in the years that followed, Leia gave birth to two children, twins, a son and a daughter. The Force was strong in both of the children. Indeed, after Luke and Leia, it's said that they are the hope of the galaxy. In the time of our saga, the children, safely hidden from the prying eyes of the dark side, are being nurtured and educated for the destiny that lies ahead. Their mother, herself a Jedi, has entered training under a Jedi Master. Where could Leia find such a teacher now that 
Obi-Wan Kenobi, Master Yoda, and her father, Anakin Skywalker, have passed on, as we know, she didn't have to look far. The Ordeal of Luke Skywalker A boy does not become a man without being tested. A callow youth, no matter what his destiny portends, does not become a Jedi without risking all. Many of the would-be hero died, lightsaber in hand, after commencing his quest for knighthood and greatness. Indeed, if Jedi knighthood were merely a matter of enthusiasm and desire, the ranks of the Jedi might have swollen to millions. But to become a fully trained and realized Jedi was always a formidable undertaking at best. To become a Jedi master, empowered to train and initiate others, was nearly impossible. Luke Skywalker was a most fortunate apprentice. He had no less than two teachers, and they were two of the greatest Jedi Knights who ever lived. The first was Obi-Wan Kenobi, the man who had instructed Luke's father in the ways of Jedi knighthood and the use of the Force. The second was Yoda, a 900-year-old Jedi master who had been Obi-Wan's own teacher. Personally trained by these two great Jedi, and linked in their strength and wisdom throughout the power of the Force, Luke rose quickly through initial stages of Jedi knowledge. Thus, he became instrumental in the overthrow of his father, the fall of the Emperor, and the restoration of the Republic. And yet, Luke's teachers, nearly despairing over his willingness to disregard the advice of this older and wiser than himself, and his failure to come to terms with his hot-headed recklessness, at times it seemed he was even on the verge of following the selfless and willful road that the selfish and willful road that leads to the dark side, in which the vast potentials of Jedi power are directed toward the triumph of the will, self-aggrandizement, and the enslavement of the many by the few, tempered by the realities of war. Inevitably, in the course of war's travail, Luke Skywalker came face to face with Darth Vader, the Empire's most brutal enforcer. During a vicious lightsaber battle, Vader severed Luke's right hand and then revealed the shattering truth that he was Luke's father. Luke survived the encounter, mentally shaken, and had his missing hand replaced by a synthetic one, but a few years later, Luke and Vader faced off again, and again their lightsabers clashed. File filled with rage against his father's betrayal, Luke fought with a frenzy that took him to the very edge of victory and madness. With his lightsaber pressed against his father's throat, a moment away from committing patricide, Luke suddenly understood that if he gave another inch to his hatred, he would belong to the dark side forever. When the evil emperor, supreme master of the dark side of the Force, turned the fullness of his malevolence against Luke, Anakin Skywalker suddenly awoke from the curse that had imprisoned him for so long. Shedding the bleak and soulless identity of Darth Vader, Anakin took the full force of his dark master's evil lightning upon himself and hurled the Emperor to his death. As Anakin Skywalker died, Luke Skywalker could only rejoice to see his father released into the light, at last rejoining the company of Jedi that he had abandoned so many years before. The life of Luke Skywalker was no ordinary human drama. A lesser man would have succumbed or been destroyed, but Luke, the young farm boy with the destiny of a Jedi, was no ordinary youth. He became a man in maturity and responsibility, and he became a master because he had the greatest ally of all. A Jedi's greatest ally is the Force. The Jedi use the Force. The Jedi's use of the Force is their greatest skill and their most difficult achievement. The Force is an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds and penetrates the entire galaxy but it does not fall to everyone to use it as a source of insight and power. A Jedi from the beginning must do what most cannot, develop a sensitivity to the very existence of the Force. They must actually feel it, feel their oneness with it, feel it tangibly flowing through them, and then their conscious awareness must join the Force, so that the knowledge available through the Force becomes their own. At some point, a Jedi learns to abandon reliance on their own mind and its effort. They learn to stretch out with their feelings, to let go of their limited idea of themselves, and to move with the deeply instinctive levels of their being. By listening, by becoming peaceful, by turning their attention to the Force, they find that place where their individuality is joined to the knowledge and power of the universe. Powers of a Jedi through the long years of struggle, Luke grew more and more adept in the skills of a Jedi. He had an increasing ability to feel the Force in himself and others, and to know the thoughts and feelings of others, know their intentions. 
Through the Force, he could even sense the moment when an, in, in, when an entirely mechanical opponent would strike. He could sense the presence of another Jedi, even across great distances, and take the measure of a Jedi's strength in the Force or whether the dark side had infected them. He could feel disturbances of every kind in the Force. With the eyes of a Jedi, he could see events taking place in another room or across the galaxy. He could glimpse the future in its many chains of probability and gauge which path events were most likely to follow. His enhanced senses and abilities, always a result of attunement with the living energy around him, gave him the, gave him the ability to move objects without physical contact, even large and heavy objects. He'd come to understand the words of Master Yoda. Size matters not. The only difference is in your mind. Like his father, he could deflect a blaster bolt with his hand or rip a piece of machinery from its anchor bolts. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi, he could create great sounds that stirred fear and sent enemies scrambling for cover. He knew the moment to strike with the... He knew the moment to... He knew the moment to strike with a lightsaber and the moment to step back. He could navigate a ship by instinct alone. He could do astounding feats of acrobatics and make incredible leaps. He had the ability to withstand great pain, fatigue, hunger, and thirst. He could transfer a portion of his life energy to another and accelerate healing in himself and others. And with a word or gesture, he could create thoughts and feelings in the weak-minded, sometimes even in the minds of the strong. Instead of growing proud as he acquired greater knowledge and skill, Luke Skywalker became more unpresuming. He recognized that he drew his strength not from himself, but from the energy of life itself, and he became aware that he had just begun to plumb the depths of the possible. For it is said the ancient Jedi Knights, including Master Yoda, had many more skills than these, even the power to manipulate the molecular structure of the universe, to live beyond death, and to guide the path of humankind to righteousness, and there lies the key. For a true Jedi, no matter how far they progress, does not use their power for its own sake or for personal ends, but for the good of others. Luke Skywalker, the man, is adept at all the principal powers and practices of a Jedi, and he stands at the threshold of awakening to the legendary powers of the great masters of old. But as we shall see, others committed to the path of the dark side are also gaining access to powerful secrets. Luke is not alone in his quest for mastery. As Luke's father once said during the time when he served the greatest known wielder of the dark side of the Force, the Emperor, the ability to destroy a planet or even a whole system is insignificant next to the power of the Force. Go carefully, Luke. You have won much, but the war is not yet over. Go carefully and remember, the Force will be with you. Always. Acknowledgements. The writer of this comic book wishes to acknowledge the technical assistance of West End Games, publishers of the Star Wars role-playing game, also the assistance of the Bennington, Vermont Star Wars Club, especially Mr. Todd Bliss, whose expert criticism has been invaluable. Star Wars Dark Empire number two. You don't know the power of the dark side. The Emperor will show you the true nature of the Force. He is your master now. Darth Vader speaking to Luke Skywalker. High over the Endor moon, a great space battle rages across the jeweled night, and in the throne room of the second Death Star, Luke Skywalker stood for the first time before Emperor Palpatine, supreme architect of the galaxy-engulfing empire. It quickly became clear to Luke that this decrepit and seemingly defenseless old man was masterfully adept in the ways of the dark side of the Force. Indeed, as Vader had warned, the Emperor had become the dark side's most powerful expression, with sublime arrogance, the old magician threw down a challenge to the young Jedi. I can feel your anger. I am defenseless. Take your weapon. Strike me down with all your hatred and your journey to the dark side will be complete. The, emperor con the Emperor's confidence rested on a sure knowledge of what he had become and what the dark side could do for him. He seemed open to all the possibilities of the moment. Luke's death, Vader's death, even his own death. No matter what the outcome of this terrible confrontation, he, Emperor Palpatine, would conquer. Flesh does not easily support this power. As we now know, at the fateful moment when the Emperor already possessed a great secret, he was utterly unafraid to die because death could lay no claim on him. 
In the beginning, as he machinated his way from senator to president of the old republic, the dark side of the force had been a key to political ascendancy. When he declared himself emperor, it became his means of consolidation and control of the galaxy. The mere fact that through the force he could observe his political enemies without their knowledge gave him an insurmountable advantage over ordinary men. And his dark side powers, combined with the most sophisticated military technology ever known, provided the strength he needed to vanquish his most dangerous opponents, the thousands of Jedi Knights, guardians of justice throughout the galaxy. But early on, Palpatine learned that addiction to the fathomless energies of the dark side carried a great price. Age and physical decay hastened their pace, and his body collapsed towards ruin like a world oppressed. It was a vexing predicament for one who had succeeded in subjugating everyone and everything that stood in his path. The most ruthless enemy of all, death, was laughing in his face. The Secret of Ashkaboda Desperate for a solution to his dilemma, the Emperor sent agents into every part of the galaxy, searching libraries, sifting through the wisdom of alien cultures, combing the detritus of civilizations long dead for forgotten secrets and cures. Jedi Masters were brought before him and questioned and tortured in the hopes that their dying screams might reveal some bit of Aeon's old lore. Eventually, something was found. An artifact in the possession of a very old and very wise Jedi named Ashkaboda. Ashkaboda was murdered, and the ancient object he held in his possession was confiscated. Then, putting the science of cloning together with the knowledge he stole from the old Jedi, the Emperor prepared himself for a transition to eternal life the cloning of absolute malevolence. So it was, while the newly formed Rebel Alliance struggled valiantly against the ever-expanding tide of tyranny and darkness, Emperor Palpatine instituted his stratagem for ultimate survival. On a hidden world deep in the galactic core, Palpatine prepared a genetic clone of himself and raised this clone to young manhood. At the moment when his diseased and crippled flesh could no longer sustain itself, he moved his mind and formless energy into the youthful replica. However, because of imperfections in the cloning process, the new vessel was more vulnerable to the depredations of the dark side. As a result, the Emperor's new body would age even more rapidly than the old, becoming corrupted and useless within a few short years. But other clones were being prepared, and others after them. With an inexhaustible supply of young and healthy receptacles at his disposal, the Emperor could, split, could spit in the eye of death and rule confidently over the Empire forever. When Darth Vader hurled Emperor Palpatine to his doom, it seemed to Luke and the Alliance that the rule of darkness had come to an end. But in that moment, when flashing blue energy rushed from exploded flesh, the Emperor entered a bodiless transitional state, a, as conscious dark force was translated across the galaxy. In the clone labs on Biss, a young Emperor opened his eyes and laughed. He had won. The Empire would survive. Welcome to Biss. A dark side world. In the deep galactic core, hidden behind the protection of the Imperial Hyperspace Security Net, lie whole systems of worlds shrouded in mystery and legend. Chief among these worlds is Biss, a place of sinister beauty and luminosity, a world completely imbued with the power of the dark side. It is on Biss that the Emperor is establishing his model for the galaxy wide society of the far future, when the dark side of the Force will rule all without the need for weapons. It is on Biss that he took a clone body, and here, new clone bodies are being continually created for him, in laboratories operated and supervised by dark side adepts and clone keepers. And it is here, in ascending orbits over the planet, that the Emperor has reunited and reformed his military forces in preparation for a final crushing blow against those who would deny him control of the galaxy. This is a place of ominous peace and harmony. Throughout the world's submissive to the Empire, Biss is renowned as a paradise whose siren call draws multitudes to willingly apply for immigration to its shores. Once there, wrapped in the power of the dark side, the immigrants become completely submissive, their life energy forever enslaved to the mind that would devour a galaxy. In the years prior to the Battle of Yavin, Biss was known as the Emperor's private retreat, here he began quietly training dark side adepts, including men of great intelligence who had committed their lives to his service. None were permitted to ascend to the level of knowledge and proficiency, but the adepts nonetheless became powerful dark side magicians in their own right. 
Using their science of darkness, they learned to feed on the life energy of others, accumulating force energies in their own bodies, and they learned to redirect this accumulated power in many ways, either as a weapon or in the manipulation of molecular structures. Legends say that adepts of the dark side had even succeeded in spawning living monstrosities, beasts and intelligent entities, some unspeakably ugly, some full of malevolent charm and symmetry, all utterly permeated by the power of the dark side. As we know it, it is to Biss that Luke Skywalker was transported, aboard a dungeon ship, after he uncovered clues to the Emperor's continued existence. It is on Biss that Luke has found an ultimate encounter with the man, if so he can be called, whose greatest wish is to extinguish the light of the Jedi Knights forever. It is also on Biss and its surrounding worlds that the Emperor is constructing his newest technological threat, the awesome destructive world devastators. War technology more lethal than the Death Star. Great fires burn in its belly, and everything it eats is transformed into new instruments of doom. Umak Leth, Imperial Engineer. With these words, the principal designer of the World Devastator introduced his concept of a factory ship that could smash a city and recycle everything it destroyed. Miles high, miles wide, powered by massive ion engines and repulsor lift gravity transformers, the World Devastators are not a sight you'd want to behold descending over your home planet. Their voracious maws hold raging molecular furnaces powered by microscopic black holes. These engines of destruction suck whole cities into their guts, breaking down everything they consume into atomic particles and simple molecules, then reassembling atoms and molecules into raw materials for outboard and onboarding manufacturing. The core of each devastator is materials processing. Blast furnaces, metalworks, foundries, stamping mills, chemical vats, and testing laboratories. Some materials are warehoused and freighted to specialized industrial plants light years distant. The rest are fed into factory levels, where slave labor and assembly line droids turn out an unending supply of TIE fighters, ground assault vehicles, lasers and ion cannons, stormtrooper gear, sensor drones, probe and weapons droids, small arms, munitions, missiles, computer components, and spare parts. The upper decks house control towers, offices, craft quarters, and recreation, hangar bays, and freight docking. Like the Death Star, every exposed surface of the World Devastator is protected by turbo laser and ion cannons and proton torpedo emplacements. Gun towers and missile launch ports scar and slash the surface of the Devastator like the countenance of a battle-hardened warrior. Every manufacturing level has its own defense emplacements and TIE squadron. Shield generators envelop the whole diabolical machine in overlapping protective energy fields. These fields can be selectively lowered or windowed to permit weapons to fire and ships to dock or embark. Finally, to prevent the world devastators from falling into unfriendly hands, their complex computer and guidance systems are regulated from the planet BIS via a single master control signal beamed through hyperspace. This crowning touch would seem to provide maximal protection for the city-smashing battle stations, and yet, even as we speak, the Rebel Alliance has activated its galaxy-wide network of Bothan spies with a desperate command, bring us the code of the master control signal. Bothans, as we know, are an alien race dedicated to the art of spying and willingly donating their services to the Alliance. Before the Great Battle of Endor, Mon Mothma spoke of critical data on the second Death Star brought to us by the Bothan spies. Many Bothans died to bring us this information. It was later revealed, however, that the information the Bothans delivered was planted by the Emperor. It is thus an open question whether the Bothans are entirely competent or entirely loyal to the Alliance. Star Wars Dark Empire, Dark Empire number 3. If Skywalker is lost, the Alliance is finished. Mon Mothma and the leaders of the New Republic watch with growing despair as their democratic order crumbles under the savage attacks of the Emperor's reunified and enhanced forces. Suddenly the truth is clear. Unless the Order of Jedi Knights is reestablished throughout the galaxy, there is very little likelihood that the Alliance will ever succeed in liberating the galaxy from the grip of the Dark Side. As the last fully realized Jedi Master, Luke Skywalker, is the most important key to the rebirth of the Knights, Luke must be found at all costs. To Nar Shadda, a lawless, derelict world. Nar Shadda, the smuggler's moon, orbits Nal Hutta, once the principal planets, 
one of the principal planets inhabited by the worm-like huts, the race of gangsters that fathered the formidable Java. Thanks to complex criminal pacts with the Empire, the huts have long ruled the galactic smuggling trade. Thus, it followed that numerous smuggler groups worked for the huts, working for the huts were permitted to establish preserves on the ancient spaceport moon. Chief among these smuggling guilds, as they like to call themselves, are the Corellians, including many of Han Solo's former companions in piracy. There is a continual buzz of traffic between Nal Hutta and its moon and the far-flung star systems of the galaxy. Great transgalactic transports and medium-sized freighters come and go. The sleek and garish caravels of the hut gang lords and beaten and rusty craft of the bounty hunters pass the Falcon as it glides in over clusters of mile-high docking towers, each a complex self-contained city topped by spaceport facilities. These once noble constructions have surrendered to population and decay, creating the specter of a spaceport moon bathed in gloom and glittering with lights. Down among the Corellian pirates. A great grid inter interconnects and overlays the upper reaches of these individual megalopolises, a massive decaying complex of docking warehouses and refueling facilities. Each level of the spaceport has landing pads and hangar bays, as well as freight depots and warehouses, not to mention gaudy old thoroughfares that cut horizontally through the whole edifice. Most of the inhabitants of this hive of villainy live and deal at the upper layers among the ruined port facilities, but there are glowing fires below, and a sub-life that thrives in the deepest spaceport canyons. Indeed, descend to the foundations of the world, and you'll find the very dregs of galactic civilization— Regressed and inbred remnants of a humanoid race that once ruled Nalhutta a thousand years in the past. Driven from their homeworld by insatiable huts, they have found grim survival in the deep underworld of the spaceport moon, feeding on the refuse that falls from the city heights. Mako Spence, Han Solo's classmate at the Imperial Academy. Because of wide variations in metabolism among the multitudinous races of the galaxy, age alone has never been a deciding factor in recruitment to military service. A healthy constitution, a sharp mind, and political influence were all it took for Mako Spence, the son of an important senator, to gain admission to the prestigious Imperial Academy. Thus, although Mako is about ten years older than Han Solo, Mako and Han were classmates in the years before the Clone Wars. But Mako proved less than officer material. While Han went on to graduate with honors, Mako bent and broke the rules at every turn. Eventually, he got himself expelled for what he called a silly prank. He stole a gram of antimatter from the school physics lab and used it to blow up the Academy's mascot moon, a barren rocky sphere in high stationary orbit over the Academy, emblazoned with the Academy's official seal. So, Mako graduated two years before Han, and when Han was eventually banished from military service for a crime he did not commit, it was Mako who introduced him to the pleasures and profits of the smuggler's trade. As a smuggler, Mako would take any risk if the money was right. In fact, he was renowned in the prime of his life for making some of the riskiest smuggling runs in the galaxy. But eventually, his luck ran out, and he was crippled in a bloody run-in with Nakoit bandits in the Otega system. Forced into semi-retirement as a traffic controller on Nar Shadda, he now keeps an eye on ships entering or leaving the Krillian sector. It's Mako who gives Han the good news, the highest clan of huts, the brothers of the gangster Jabba, following their father Zorba's failed attempt at revenge, had put an absolutely huge price on the heads of Leia and Han for the death of Jabba. Shug Nix, another cohort from the wild youth of Han Solo. This isn't a world where people come out to meet you. Once you're let through their shields, when they're working, you're on your own. If you're transporting contraband, you will know your warehouse desi warehouse des you will know your warehouse destination, and your confederates will be waiting there. If you're just coming in for a good time, there are many places to berth your ship and many swindlers who will be happy to take your money. Han punches up the com code of Shug Nix, a half-breed Karelian master mechanic whose mother was a Thielin, one of the now extinct near-human races. Han and Nix go back a long way, to the time when Han knew Lando Calrissian. In the wild years that followed his banishment from Imperial from Imperial military service, Han was a free booter living from deal to deal. Between smuggling runs, he'd often as not stay on Nar Shadda, gambling at the Sabak tables and staging hot-dogging space races with his friends, Lando Calrissian and Shug Nix. 
Nix was more undisciplined than Han and Lando, if that's possible, but he was also older and took a protective interest in the wild kids, as he called them. It was Nix who taught Han and Lando how to tear down a hyperdrive and how to get the most parsecs out of a third-hand Modog power coupling. In his mature years, Shug Nix runs a ship repair facility famed for and wide famed far and wide for working miracles on junkers nobody else will touch. Access to Nix's space barn is strictly controlled by Nix. Nix's secure entrance to his repair facility is the chute, a square tunnel about a mile long. Its opening is masked by a huge hologram, and its entire length is protected by lateral firing turbo lasers. This unusual piece of architecture is discarded prototype from a section of an unfinished second Death Star, rescued by Nix from an industrial junkyard in Bonadam. With great difficulty and enthusiasm, Nix disassembled the chute and dragged it halfway across the galaxy, installing it in an abandoned layer of the Corellian sector of Nar Shaddaa. His reasons? Nix makes a lot of money servicing ships belonging to wealthy huts, and a growing segment of the population on Nar Shaddaa is survived by stripping expensive fixtures and accessories from the space vehicles of the rich. Salah's End and the Starlight Intruder Nix's garage is cluttered with disassembled space vehicles of all sizes and configurations. Beat-up vintage airspeeders and sleek star cruisers disgorge confused masses of electronic plumbing and conduit. Parts and tools are everywhere. Whole sub-assemblies hanging from lifts and cradles. Grease-spattered alien mechanics struggle with ancient hyperdrives, turning the old systems to near-new specs. The Falcon soars under a very large freighter webbed in a tangle of scaffolding. Perched high on the scaffolding is somebody else, Han used to know, giving off bright splashes of light with her ion-flowing welding torch. The ship is the Starlight Intruder, and the welder on the scaffolding is Salah Zend. The Intruder, a cobbled-together monstrosity, a fantastic flying junk heap, was pieced together by Salah Zend from parts scavenged from all over the galaxy. Not a beautiful ship, but one that will weld... but one that will be... A but one that will be well able to transport immense loads at faster than light speeds once it's finished, if it ever is. Han met Sala back when they both ran Spice in the Stennis system. They had a friendly competition, seeing who could make the Kessel run the fastest and who could cut the best deal with the tight-fisted Nesses, Nessies between runs. Nessies between runs. Han and Sala became an item, spending a lot of time together. They'd known each other three years when Salah's navicomputer malfunctioned and she dropped out of hyperspace on collision course with a new neutron star. Han managed to save her, but she lost her ship and was left badly shaken by the experience. Overnight, Salah was of a mind to get married and settle down. With Han Solo. In those days, Han Solo va viewed marriage as a one-way ticket to the gas mines. Either that, or he must have sensed someone else in his future. Whatever the case, the galaxy is a big place, and it's awfully easy to say goodbye to someone and never see them again. Until today. Salah's end remains unattached, making a good living as a welder and gunrunner. Leia has to wonder if Salah harbors any leftover feelings for Han. In the Turbulent Streets of the Vertical City in the streets of the maze-like Corellian city are gaudy with lights and hollow displays, crowded with smugglers and aliens and bounty hunters, even the occasional party of Imperial stormtroopers. The city's population also includes a class of medicants, former smugglers and freebooters who long ago were reduced to sleeping in doorways and begging for coins. Han and Leia are making their way through the turbulent streets toward Han's old living quarters when they bump into one of these unfortunates, an old woman squatting in the gutter, surrounded by all her belongings. The old woman is Vima Deboda, a 200-year-old fallen Jedi. The Fall of a Jedi For nearly a hundred years, Vima Deboda was an illustrious woman warrior, fierce in the cause of justice. During the time she was raised one daughter, during that time she raised one daughter, Nima, who she taught the Jedi path. Unfortunately, her daughter fell in with a group of rebellious young Jedis who gradually seduced her to the dark side of the Force. Then, further defying her mother's wisdom, Nima betrothed herself to an Audithan warlord, ruler of twelve systems on the far perimeter of the galaxy. When her barbaric husband proceeded to treat her like chattel, 
Nima, as was her nature, attempted to use the dark side against him and failed. He threw her in chains. Through the force, the poor girl called out to her mother from afar. Vima made haste to the ruling Audithan system, but she was too late. The savage warlord had fed Nima to the rancors that run freely on the Audithan forests. For the first time in her life, Vima gave way to rage. Confronting the warlord, she cleaved him in half with her lightsaber. Then, pondering the death of her only daughter, she gave way to despair. So it was that Vima de Boda began to lose her connection to the Force. Finally came the time of the Great Purge, when the Emperor and his henchman Darth Vader unleashed the extermination of the Jedi. Consumed with fear for her life, Vima further disowned her heroic past and hurled herself down among the lost. As Vima tells Leia, during, the time, during that dark time, nearly everyone was hunted and nearly everyone was killed, but Vima, impoverished and forgotten, was among the overlooked. As Leia can clearly perceive, the Force is still active in Vima de Boda, but covered by a great shadow. And Vima can see the Force in Leia. Indeed, a great communication takes place between the two women, on a level that Han Solo cannot perceive. In the moment of Vima's confession, it is as if the fire of the Jedi, long smoldering in the old woman, leaps forth of its own accord, adding itself to the power already active in the younger Jedi. Without a doubt, Leia Organa has not seen the last of Vima de Boda. Star Wars, Dark Empire number four. The Jedi Knights were powerful and respected throughout the galaxy for a thousand generations. The technology of lightsabers is almost as old as the Order of Jedi Knights, and the Jedi, as is well known, have served as guardians of peace and justice throughout the galaxy for over 25,000 years. The technology of lightsabers is very old indeed. The Jedi weapon that Leia received from the fallen Jedi Vima de Boda is about 10,000 years old. This lightsaber was given to Vima by her own master, who received it from his master, who didn't say where she obtained it. But in fact, we know that this particular lightsaber surfaced about, four, about 800 years ago in an archaeological dig on the planet Ossus in the Adiga system. Ossus was an important Jedi stronghold in most ancient times. Some scholars have speculated that the Order of Jedi Knights began on Ossus, but mysteriously, all the cities of Ossus were abandoned and left to decay about 7,000 years ago. Today, Ossus is a mysterious place, a place of ruins, populated by a gentle, primitive folk who may or may not be descended from the original inhabitants. Were the lightsabers of old any different than the lightsabers of today? Such an old light sword is not a worthy weapon for you. According to the Galactic Encyclopedia, when a Jedi lightsaber is activated, a charge of pure energy flows from a power cell through a series of, series of jewels that focus the energy into a tight parallel beam. The beam passes through a lens at the center of the handle, extends into space, and then arcs back along itself to a high-energy flux aperture mounted in the saber's handguard. The length of the beam is directly proportional to its energy level. Each saber beam has a unique frequency which determines the feel of the blade and how it handles when cutting or when contacting another blade. The frequency also determines the blade's color and sound. The oldest sabers use jewels formed by natural processes, but the Jedi can forge synthetic jewels with a small furnace, a few basic elements, and the power of the Force. The lightsabers continued to evolve, at least until the time of the Emperor, at least until the time of the Empire, the most sophisticated weapons use miniature molecular power cells and superconducting circuits. The energy efficiency of the modern lightsaber is very close to 100%. In most ancient times when the lightsaber was invented, warriors did not possess the sophisticated technology of today. The very earliest lightsabers were based on the discovery of natural crystals that spontaneously emit powerful bursts of light and energy at their resonant frequencies. It was the Jedi who discovered these crystals and learned to harness their power using more common jeweled stones to direct the raw energy bursts in a coherent beam. The crystals were found in only one place, the Adiga system. The ancient Jedi were powerful, but they were supplanted by the dark side. This is something almost magical. There is something almost magical about the old Jedi weapons. To hold one in your hands is to commune with a time when the light of the Force burned very, very brightly in the hearts of the Jedi. This was a time when the dark side of the Force was but an insubstantial shadow, utterly ineffective against the powers of the Jedi Knights. How things have changed in eons since! Today, the glories of freedom and the light of justice are nearly forgotten everywhere in the galaxy. The dark side has grown powerful, the old ways are fading, and the Jedi are almost extinct. 
And yet the Jedi have a saying. In a time of greatest adversity, the great Jedi will be born. So it is that a man, Luke Skywalker, heir to a 25,000-year-old tradition, has found the courage to challenge the dark side on its own ground. Luke has made this dangerous choice to learn the secrets of the dark side. For this Jedi, it was the only way. The Emperor's Darkest Secrets Satisfied that his young apprentice had crossed the threshold from which there is no returning, the, Empire, the Emperor unveils his teaching, and Luke is given the knowledge that was bestowed on his father before him. Dark side wisdom is strangely practical, crude, and even uninspired. Its entire purpose is the perfection of the will and the expansion of personal power. It is a knowledge that can be terribly seductive because of the ease with which specific powers and abilities are attained. The true Jedi Knight knows powers that the true Jedi know that powers that come easily are only the beginning of understanding. A Jedi is warned not to cling to these powers and to move on to the more difficult levels of training. Those who are seduced by the dark side know only that their individual will has been enhanced. All that is required for them is a sensitivity to the energies of the Force and an act of surrendering to the path of anger and violence, regardless of the consequences to others. The Emperor has become a master of the dark will and its abilities. He is even writing a dark side compendium that he claims will eventually fill several hundred volumes. In this compendium, the Emperor has so far defined two principal empires of dark side lore. The Emperor's first book, The Book of Anger, is about the initial surrender to the dark side and the exercise of the will over the energies of the Force for destructive ends. His second book, The Weakness of Inferiors, teaches in great detail about the psychology and politics of power. A third book, still in manuscript, is called The Creation of Monsters. The Book of Anger The Emperor's first empire evolved from several sources. Many Jedi secrets were revealed by trained Jedi who capitulated to the dark side. Other secrets more ancient were obtained from the Jedi holocron. A third source was the archaic magical concepts that were known and used, and are still known and used, by the most primitive peoples. According to the Emperor, when the Force is sensed moving by emotion from, one ver from the very center of the body and mediated from the lower vital centers of the being, it acts with the destructive power of a storm and the savagery of a beast. Anger is considered the most potent catalyst to this kind of power, and anger becomes rage when channeled through the vital gate in the center of a body and can unleash absolutely unstoppable potency through the body. Add the exquisite control of a fine intelligence standing watch over anger, and you have aggression that can kill with precision, crush cartilage from afar, or, he claims, murder opponents from a great distance. The Weakness of Inferiors The second major work to date is devoted to the secrets of control without violence over the innocent, the ignorant, and all inferiors. It is this arrogant teaching of which the Emperor is most proud, for he developed it entirely himself, out of his own experience. Without hesitation, he reveals it to Luke, so sure is he that Luke, like his father before him, will be drawn to its seductive embrace. We quote the Emperor's main tenets on this subject. 1. All power comes from outside the weak. The weak have never been known to believe in themselves or in their ability to wield power. 2. The face of authority. The weak live as in a dream. All their thoughts, actions, and urges are governed by the face and the voice that controls this dream. The face and voice they have learned to obey, the face and voice of authority. 3. The Law of Fear A consequence of the first two tenets is that the weak live in fear. The mere suggestion of violence from one in authority is enough to inspire their obedience. How can one who doesn't believe in his own power stand against the power of another? It is impossible. 4. The weak do not understand the force. The force is the ultimate means to gain authority over the weak. The weak do not understand the force. The weak do not sense the force. Therefore, how can they understand or use the force? So it is that the weak are at the mercy. So it is that the weak are at the mercy of those who know and use the power of the force. The proper use of the force can inspire awe and obedience in the weak. It has been said that anyone who knows the ways of the Force can set himself up as a king on any world where only he knows the ways of the Force. Any Jedi could do this, but the Jedi, fools that they are, adhere to a religion in which the Force is used only in the service of others. How short-sighted of them! 
Is that not why they lost the galaxy to the dark side? Sitting at the feet of the emperor, Luke hears these words from the emperor's own lips, inflected with a sneer and punctuated with a wicked laugh. Do you see, young Skywalker? Your father was right the first time. The dark side is the true path for a Jedi. All other choices lead to extinction. My clones are the future of the galaxy. And yet, for all his boasting, Emperor Palpatine has paid a great price. The energies of the dark side eat away at the very fiber and flesh of his being. Yes, he grows continually more powerful in the ways of the dark side, but he also sickens, for the powers of the dark side are vast, and ultimately they twist into a vortex of annihilation, destroying the body and drawing one into a terrifying disembodied state. Dying and decrepit, the Emperor felt himself being pulled inexorably toward that end. It was a fate worse than death, for disembodiment in the dark side is perpetual madness, as if to live forever like an open wound. Without respite, it was a fate the Emperor wanted to postpone at all costs. Fortunately, from his point of view, fortunately, from his point of view, he found the Jedi holocron. Fortunately, from his point of view, there was the science of cloning. Fortunately, death and its drive and his dive into annihilation could be postponed, perhaps forever. Your father knew the dark side well. Luke is perhaps learning more about the dark side than he wants to know. The more the Emperor reveals, the more Luke is repulsed. The sheer depravity of the man would shake the soul of the strongest Jedi. But Luke must continually remind himself of his vow to conquer the dark side from within. Luke's father understood these secrets, these powers, and willingly used them to crush and enslave multitudes of galactic citizens. Your father knew the dark side well, especially my teachings of weakness. How could he inspire fear? You have the talent. You are a Skywalker, after all. You can be like him. You can be greater than he was. Can Luke really conquer the dark side? I have taken the first steps down the road that my father took. What if I fell in my purpose? What if I lose my grip? What if I become exactly like him? What if I become an enslaver, a despot, or a murderer? But my father, my real father, is free, and Darth Vader is dead. Reminding him of that, Reminding himself of that, Luke finds the strength to go on with his daring mission. While pretending to be the apt and willing student of the Emperor, Luke does everything he can to sabotage the Emperor's attack on Calamari. As Supreme Commander of the Imperial Forces, Luke has access to the top-secret codes that govern the Emperor's new world devastators from afar. The codes are beamed through a priority hyperspace communications channel on to the onboard computers that control every aspect of the devastator's operation and function. When Lando Calrissian and Wedge Antilles watch a great devastator go down in the Calamari Sea, Lando knows something strange is going on. Whoever is in charge of these monsters is an idiot. You'd almost think he wants to lose. Indeed, the man in charge does want to lose, because his name is Luke Skywalker. He is a Jedi Master, and he is working for the Rebel Alliance. The Emperor has taken Luke's betrayal into account. Does the Emperor know of his protege's lack of obedience? Of course he does. I expected to take some damage from him. Any worthy opponent is going to inflict injury. If he doesn't, he's not worth troubling with. Let a few devastators be destroyed. Let Skywalker think he's getting the best of me. As long as he believes he's succeeding, I have him in my grasp. And as long as I hold him, the more vulnerable he becomes to the unfathomable power of the dark side. Think what, he'll, think what he'll do when he's a fully mine. When he is fully mine. When he is working for the Empire. Working to help us win. Conferring with the most trusted officers, the Emperor counters every move that Luke makes. Quietly, the Emperor cuts his losses and maximizes wins over his opponent. One day soon, Skywalker will wake up and find that he can no longer go back to his friends. He will look in a mirror and he will see his true face, the face of power, the face of the dark side. Star Wars Dark Empire number 5 The Jedi Holocron is a legendary wisdom source lost for over 300 years. With Princess Leia in his evil grasp, the Emperor can't resist showing off his most prized possession, the ancient artifact called the Jedi Holocron. 
The holocron, a glowing cube that sits comfortably in the palm of his hand, combines crystalline formations and hardware. Its metal parts are embossed with curious designs suggesting great antiquity. As the emperor himself explains, Jedi teachings were recorded in its internals many centuries ago using primitive hologram technology. Leia recalls that Obi-Wan Kenobi once described the holocron to Luke. Ben told Luke that the holocron was a lost wisdom source containing some of the most secret Jedi history and teachings as revealed by long-departed Jedi masters. As Ben put it, the teachings of the holocron include thousand-year-old secrets, but they also but they also include the words and faces of men in the process of discovery. The Jedi masters of old were not afraid to let their minds roam freely, for they were hungry for even greater understanding of the mystery of the mysterious force which has become their power and their ally. Ben said that if the holocron, if the holocron could ever be found, it would help re-establish the Jedi Knights. What Obi-Wan didn't know was that during the time of extermination of the Jedi, the Emperor had discovered the holocron among the belongings of a very old and very wise Jedi named Asuka Boda. Asuka Boda was murdered, and the ancient object passed into the possession of the dark side. This was unfortunate, because to a certain extent, the knowledge hidden in the holocron can be accessed by anyone. The Emperor learned considerable arcane information from the holocron, and he exploited this knowledge, twisting it to his own ends. Some of his vaunted dark side secrets are in fact corruptions of teachings in the holocron. But the holocron has many levels and many branching paths concealed within its circuitry. Only a Jedi knight only Jedi only a Jedi knight can unlock these only a Jedi knight can unlock these hidden places. So it was that the greatest portion of the holocron's wisdom remained sealed away from the emperor's prying eyes. In the hands of a true Jedi, the holocron becomes an interactive wisdom source. Through the Force, things you will see, other places, other thoughts, the future, the past, old friends, long gone. Master Yoda. On the most superficial level, Jedi Holocron is, as Palpatine suggests, merely a recording device, an example of primitive hologram technology. It is a vast library in a small container, a collection of books whose authors visit the reader and speak to them directly but a pattern of organic crystals at the heart of the holocron reacts to the presence of a true Jedi. These crystals are the key to the deeper levels of the holocron's mysteries. As Leia makes contact with the chain of teachers whose words and images are recorded in the holocron, the first to appear is the holocron, is the holocron gatekeeper, Bodo Boss. Without ever being questioned by Leia, the shimmering image of Bodo Boss speaks of what most concerns her. Jedi. Hear the words of Bodo Boss. Some among us have thought to conquer the dark side by learning its secrets. Three, to my knowledge, three have tried this. Perished. Every one of them perished. The long-departed Jedi words have the ring of terrible prophecy, for Luke Skywalker is at this very moment attempting to penetrate the power of the dark side. Leia now understands that Luke is not the first to believe the dark side can be conquered from within. Others have tried and failed. The stories of the other Jedi Knights who set out to learn the secrets of the Dark Side are contained in the Holocron. As the Millennium Falcon, safely away from Biss, journeys to the battle zone at Calamari, Leia retires in privacy to hold the Holocron in her hands and ask Master Bodo Boss to tell her more. Bodo Boss obliges his new student by relating the tale of Ulic Keldroma. The Coming of the Krath Four thousand years ago, the Jedi were numerous and powerful throughout the galaxy, but it was also a time when thousands of Force-sensitive individuals, including many who had the potential to become Jedi Knights, were succumbing to the Dark Side's fascination. In those days, there was a star system called the Empress Teta system, after the woman warlord who, in the early days of space travel, had conquered and united its seven worlds. As the millennia passed, the Teta system, which is situated in the deep galactic core, had become the prime source of carbonite, a volatile metal that proved indispensable in the manufacture of faster-than-light engines, and secondarily, the suspended preservation of living flesh. The descendants of Empress Teta were still the figurehead rulers of seven mining worlds, but they had been forced to share their power, to a large degree, with the commercial interests that had developed the carbonite mines. Together, the Tata royalty and the wealthy mine owners formed an elite society, a tightly knit group that reigned with arrogant abandon over multitudes of the less fortunate. 
The sons and daughters of this elite were a self-indulgent lot, with much leisure time in their hands. As many, as a way of amusing themselves, these young aristocrats began dabbling in the lore of primitive magic. At some point, in, at some point in their mischievous experiments, the young Tedans crossed an invisible threshold and tapped into a strata of magic that unleashed its malign mental reality with unexpected power. What had started as a game suddenly grew serious and took on a life of its own. In the weeks following this fateful day, the sinister power utterly shattered the minds of the young Tedan elite and began to transform them into its willing servants. Under the guise of the, under the guidance of Satal Kato, the first of their group to fall, the young Tedans formed a secret society dedicated to the dark arts. They called themselves the Krath, after an evil magician god from the fairy tales they had learned as children. In fact, their experience was far from the realm of fairy tales. The youthful sorcerers had been ensnared and swallowed up by the dark side of the Force. Ulit Keldroma, a great Jedi of 4,000 years ago. Ulit Keldroma was a great Jedi warrior and master of those days, pure of heart and purpose, without corruption of any kind. Some said he was arrogant, but those who knew him best said he merely possessed unbound confidence, being very strong in the ways of the Force. By the time Ulit Keldroma heard of the Krath, they were well on their way to their dark destiny, having surreptitiously murdered their own parents and staged a political coup, taking control of the seven Tetan worlds. This was a problem for the Jedi Knights, and it fell to Ulit Keldroma as watchman of the Tatum system to bring the Krath to justice. But it quickly became obvious that any attempt at, re at arresting the Krath would result in great bloodshed. The Krath possessed spacefaring armies. Every... Against every tenet of the galactic constitution, they declared themselves ready to go to war against the Jedi. A Jedi assembly was called on Mount Meru in the desert world of Deneba, of, a ten, of the 10,000 masters who had assembled primary responsibility for the core system. Of the 10,000 10, masters who had assumed primary responsibility for the core systems. Ulit Keldroma argued strongly that war was unnecessary and absolutely the wrong way to deal with the power of the Krath. We are witness to sinister developments. A war with the armies of the Dr of the Krath might last for years. Many Jedi will die. And what will be gained by this bloodshed? We will have slain thousands, for the Krath themselves will survive. The dark powers intact. I suggest that the Krath coup is dangerous, is a dangerous development that demands special measures. This is the first time to my knowledge that the dark side of the force has been used to take large-scale political power. This kind of episode must be stopped before it spreads, and it must be torn out by its very roots. The only way that will happen is if one of us joins the Krath and learns the secrets of the darkness that has possessed them and made them powerful. A warning from Master Thawne. Many other Jedi warned Uluk against the foolhardy enterprise he had, con he had conceived. Master Thawne of Ambria spoke very eloquently of the Jedi path. Uluk, my friend... The dark side has been with us since the beginning, and there is much accumulated understanding about its nature. But never forget, there is the way of the Jedi, and there is the path that leads to destruction. A Jedi who takes up the path of the dark side is no longer a Jedi. He who learns the dark way will become infected with darkness. His judgment will become clouded, and he will forget the good things he has learned. If he persists in this attempt to bridge the two divergent roads, he will be torn apart in his very being. Do not underestimate the power of the dark side at all costs. Do not underestimate the power of the dark side. But Ulit Keldroma was convinced he had discovered the best way to conquer the opponent of the Jedi, and as watchman of the Tita system, he had the right and the obligation to proceed according to his own judgment. So Ulit Keldroma disguised his identity and merged with the social life of Sinigar, the latest city in the Seven Worlds. The largest city in the Seven Worlds. Eventually, after many months, he found his way into the friendship and confidence of the ruling elite. Ulit Keldroma became a Krath, warrior magus and master of the dark side. What happened next is not completely known. According to the Jedi Holocron, Ulit Keldroma disappeared from view for a number of years. The other Jedi Masters tried to locate him, using all the mental powers of, at their disposal, but each time they attempted to penetrate the cloak of dark power that enveloped the sanctums of the Krath, they came up against a wall of thought like blackest iron, and could advance no further. 
Then, without warning, Ulit Keljoma reappeared as a high priest of the Krath. During the years of his disappearance, during the years of his disappearance, he had been transformed completely into a warrior magus with dark powers far beyond those demonstrated by any other member of the Krath. His reappearance coincided with a political struggle among the Krath leadership. The Krath split into three groups, one dominated by Satal Kato, the founder. The second group was dominated by Satal's cousin Alima, a woman whose dark side powers included the ability to create a mass to create mass hallucinations. The third group was ruled by Ulut Keldroma. Keldroma's organization was militaristic and bloodthirsty. He set out on a path of conquest, gathering treasure, armies, and weaponry. In short order, he possessed a vast fleet of faster-than-light warships that could sweep down unexpectedly on worlds in distant parts of the galaxy and quickly pillage their ruling cities. Needless to say, Keldroma was declared an enemy of the Republic, and Keldroma declared himself an enemy of the Jedi. As the Jedi Knights took action to protect the worlds threatened by Keldroma's piracy, the sorceress Alima formed an alliance with Keldroma using her wicked dark side talents against the Jedi with great effectiveness. The conflict that followed is remembered as an important historical turning point in the history of the Jedi Knights. It was the first war in which dark side powers were used on a massive scale, affecting the fate of millions. Leia fears the unthinkable. Leia did not have time to hear the rest of the story and learned the final fate of Ulit Keldroma because the Millennium Falcon had completed its journey in the Calamari Battleground. But she did hear one last admonition from the gatekeeper of the holocron, holocron Bodo Bas. A Jedi does not grasp at power. A Jedi is not a dominator, not an impressor. To grasp for power is to abandon the ways of the Force, such as one ceases to know the Force, except in his dark side. To grasp at power is to take up the path that leads to destruction. The Dominator is the enemy, yes. But the Jedi do not use the dark powers of the Dominator against him. Hearing these words as the Falcon continues, comes out of hyperspace, Leia is filled with fresh apprehension, for she knows that Luke, in his audacious quest, has done the unthinkable. He has used the powers of the dark side. Suddenly, Leia feels very alone and helpless. What if Luke is consumed by the dark side? What if he's transformed into a lord of war, like his father before him? She is forced to compli she is forced to contemplate a terrible possibility. Her brother may already be lost, like Ulit Keldroma, like Darth Vader, and she and her children may be the last of the Jedi. Where will Leia, not a Jedi master, find the strength to carry on, much less conquer? How can she, a solitary Jedi knight, prevent the final collapse of the Rebel Alliance and the entire galaxy? into the sinister embrace of the dark side? Star Wars Dark Empire number 6 Now you will experience the full power of the dark side. In his monumental compendium of dark side lore, the Book of Anger, Emperor Palpatine describes the origin of four storms. I have learned that anger and will joined together are the greatest power. I have learned to mediate. <laughs> Meditate anger and will with clarity and precision, and I have learned to open the hidden reservoirs of dark side power. Anger, concentrated by will in the vital center of the body, creates a portal through which vast energies are released, the energies of the dark side of the force. Standing watch with the mind in the meditation of anger, I have slain my enemies from great distances. Through the dark side power that permeates the galaxy, I have created lightning and unleashed its destructive fire. Using this knowledge, I can destroy, I can unleash the dark side energies that are all around us, even to shatter the fabric of space itself. In this way, I have created storms. According to the Emperor, through a simple act of will, he's able to generate energy storms, vastly destructive, virtually unstoppable force storms, he calls them. What he also admits in his Book of Anger is that he is not able to completely control such phenomena once he has triggered at their onset. However, in the years since he wrote these words, the Emperor has continued to perfect his dark side abilities, and he now boasts to Luke that he has perfect control of his four storms. Whether such boasts are true or not, they are not, one thing becomes abundantly clear from the Emperor's confrontation with Luke and Leia. These explosions of chaotic fury are no match for the greatest power in the galaxy. A Jedi's strength flows from the Force. My ally is the Force, and a powerful ally it is. 
Life creates it and makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we not. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter, Master Yoda. A Jedi's lightsaber is a wonderful weapon, and in the hands of a fully trained Jedi Knight, it is even a match for the technology of modern warfare. Using only a lightsaber, Luke Skywalker has the... Luke Skywalker was able to deflect the cannon fire of an AT-AT Imperial Walker back on itself, disabling the walker. But as they grew older and wiser, the greatest Jedi, beings like Master Yoda, seldom, if ever, were known to use the lightsaber. Many a young Jedi has asked their... Many a young Jedi has asked their master about this, and the old masters were quick to respond, because a Jedi's strength, all their strength, flows from the Force, and the more a Jedi learns to use the Force, the more they join themselves to that luminosity that is the very nature and substance of the Force. Gently, persistently, Master Yoda tried to move Luke through the rigors of physical combat to the higher levels of Jedi training, but Luke, impetuous, willful, full of youthful hunger for action, seemed to never hear what Yoda tried to tell him. He has paid a great price for his heedlessness, but from the consequences of experience, he has also learned a great lesson. Here at last, at the terrible moment when he and Leia confront the untrammeled power of the most sinister agent of the dark side, Luke is compelled to find and take hold of these resources that were known by Master Yoda and by the greatest Jedi of old. A tidal wave of light. The key to Luke's training is the moment when he and Leia realize the Emperor is no longer defined by his physical form, but has become a chaotic nexus of dark energies that swell and burst open the fabric of space, tearing apart everything in the vicinity, human and machine. Nothing can match such dark power. Nothing, except these twin Jedi joined in birth and now joined to their greatest strength of the Jedi, the power of luminous beings. For one long extended moment, Luke and Leia are united in the Force, in, united to the Force in all its intensity, and the Force flows through them like a tidal wave of light. This is the unquenchable light of the Jedi, the ultimate reality on which their way is founded. This is the principle from which the Jedi derived their very existence and went on to become the maintainers of peace and justice during the time of the Old Republic. Before such clarity and power, the cataclysmic rage of the Emperor cannot stand. The limitations of the dark side are known. The dark side power has always been exploited by the infinitely murderous, infinitely grasping few to the detriment of many. Seduced by violence, each dark side magician is convinced that to curse, to annihilate, and to unleash unspeakable energies of physical destruction is the supreme gift of the Force. But in fact, as the greatest Jedi Masters have known, such powers are a kind of Ch chimera, because they can only threaten this crude flesh. Yes, such powers can inspire fear and obedience in the weak and the weak-minded, but such powers cannot touch the brightness that surrounds us and binds us together, the brightness to which the Jedi, as luminous beings, are forever joined. Luke often wondered what happened to Ben and Yoda when they passed out of this universe and their physical bodies simply vanished, leaving only heaps of empty robes behind. How could such a marvel be? Now, as the floodgates of the Force open in him, Luke begins to understand how such things are possible. The Force itself, beyond the physical outlines of the body, is not only a Jedi's greatest ally, but their unshakable Loomis reality. And the Force, in all its intensity, belongs to no single entity, but to all. One Jedi cannot conquer the dark side alone. I made a big mistake. I thought I had to save the galaxy all by myself. But the way of the Jedi is not a solitary path. Many have died defending the truth. Many are together in this great war. Luke Skywalker. During his time as the Emperor's apprentice, Luke learned many things about the dark side of the Force, things his father knew, things Luke is not yet ready to discuss, even with Leia. But the greatest lesson he learned was not written in the teachings of the Emperor. The evil works of the Empire will never be undone until the fire of the Jedi Knights is rekindled throughout the galaxy. Where to begin? There are two Jedi, himself and Leia, and there are Han and Leia's children, all potential Je Jedi. Leia herself has said that her children will become Jedi and Luke will train them. She knows. But two of them, the twins, Jason and Jaina, are still babies. The third is yet unborn. Does Luke Skywalker have to wait 20 years or more for a time when Leia's children are fully grown before beginning his next great task? 
He doubts that he can afford to wait so long. Luke knows that the emperor has even ch has every chance of repeating the feat he achieved after the Battle of Endor. If even one clone vat survives in the laboratories on Biss, the emperor may even now be making good his threat to live forever. If that is the case, and nobody knows it is not, Palpatine already has put into action a master plan for retaking the galaxy. Thanks to Luke and R2, the Alliance has learned that the Emperor intends to launch his Imperial forces from his fortress worlds in the Deep Core in a deadly series of wave assaults, retaking system after system until the entire galaxy cries out in surrender. Even if Palpatine himself does not survive, perhaps someone else, even another dark side adept for instance, or one of the Emperor's most trusted commanders, can proceed with the battle plan as if nothing has changed. And isn't there also a danger to Leia's children? Didn't the Emperor swear in Luke's presence to take possession of Leia's third child? The Jedi Knights must rise again. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Master Yoda, even Luke and Leia's father Anakin Skywalker have all disappeared, gone from the galaxy. Mysteriously, for reasons known only to themselves, they no longer appear to Luke or offer him their guidance. And yet there's a feeling, a sense of hidden nearness, as if they are watching him, sometimes frowning, sometimes nodding their heads. Others, too, untold thousands of departed Jedi, are with them. Luke feels a unity among the Jedi, reaching beyond this crude flesh, stretching back 25,000 years and more to the beginning of the Jedi Knights. It is as if the attention of the departed Jedi can never fully be turned away from the galaxy, until the great crimes of the Empire are finally undone. No, Luke Skywalker is not alone, not by a long shot, and he is not without resources. After all, he and Leia have recovered the Jedi Holocron. The Holocron, a long-lost Jedi wisdom source, contains a trove of histories, teachings, and Jedi secrets. Didn't Ben tell him that if the Holocron could be found, it would help re-establish the Jedi Knights? Could it be possible that the Holocron will lead Luke and Leia to other Jedi? In the years since the Battle of Endor, it has become amply clear to Luke and Leia that the Emperor and Vader did not succeed in entirely eradicating the Jedi Knights. A few survived. Remnants escaped detection, Vima Deboda, for instance, and the mad Jedi Joris Gabouth. Luke and Leia escaped detection because they were the offshoots, they were the offspring of Jedi, hidden from the prying eyes of the Emperor. Could other children of Jedi exist? If so, is the Force strong in them? Do they only need the hand of a Jedi Master to, un to uncover their potential? Luke remembers that Leia once underwent a mind probe at the hands of Darth Vader. It was a terrible and exhausting experience, but her talent, but her latent Jedi abilities remained undetected by her own father. Surely there, surely then there must be others. As Luke contemplates the future, he's filled with a burst of optimism and fresh hope. He's also filled with a sense of urgency. Although a great battle has been won, there is no more time for there is no time for celebration. When the enemy is down but not finished, that is the moment to press the advantage. That is the moment to move rapidly to retake everything that has been lost. This is the beginning. Leia, you, your children, the Holocron. I feel it. Great things are coming. The Jedi Knights will rise again. Star Wars Dark Empire Character and Equipment Sketches by Cam Kennedy Star Wars Dark Empire Trade Paperback First Edition 1993 Cover by Dave Dorson, Dorman Star Wars Dark Empire Trade Paperback Third Edition 2003 Cover by Mark Zug Star Wars Dark Empire Trade Paperback Introduction by Kevin J. Anderson Is the universe big enough for us all, for all of us? The Star Wars films are such visual masterpieces that it seems perfectly appropriate that the stories be extended into a graphic novel format. Following in the footsteps of such an impressive predecessor, however, is a challenge indeed. With Dark Empire, author Tom Veach and artist Cam Kennedy have brought a level of grandeur, spectacular color, and mind-blowing exotica that is sure to capture the same sense of wonder we all felt when watching Star Wars for the first time. For Bantham Books and Lucasfilm LTD, I myself am writing these Star Wars novels, working with the other authors who are also telling this, this saga that takes place in the years following Return of the Jedi. Dark Empire is a crucial part of our collective imagined epic, but Tom and Cam's story 
storyline is told with a different palette than mere prose. It is an experience no Star Wars fan will forget. A long time ago, in a movie theater far, far away, I saw Star Wars for the very first time. Like so many others, I walked out knowing I had seen something that would forever change science fiction films never before, never before had such an ambitious, detailed, and enjoyable science fiction movie been made. Star Wars boiled down everything that was the essence of science fiction for me, capturing the heart of a type of story I'd been reading since the time I could read, since the time I could simp sound out words on paper, moving my lips to the letters as I shined a flashlight at a book under my blanket long past under my blanket long past the time I was supposed to be asleep. I don't remember how many times I saw Star Wars when it first played, though by no means can I claim to be one of the record holders. I remember waiting and waiting for The Empire Strikes Back and then engaging in endless discussions over which of the two was the better film. I also remember that Return of the Jedi was the first time I ever paid the exorbitant price of four fifty to see a motion picture. Then, for years, Star Wars fans went hungry. In 1990, seven years after Jedi, the science fiction trade magazines reported that Bantam Books had signed with Lucasfilm to publish several sequel novels to the Star Wars films. Later, I read Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire and was pleased to see an ambitious and detailed story in the tradition of the films rather than a mere fluffy adventure starring a, a few familiar faces. In the meantime, I had established my own career as a science fiction writer. My novels ranged from hard science fiction through fantasy to mystery thrillers, but, I took, but, it, took me by complete, but it took me completely by surprise when Betsy Mitchell, my editor at Bantam Books, called me to ask, Do you like Star Wars? Puzzled, I answered, Of course I like Star Wars. Everybody likes Star Wars. Do you want to write three sequels? Do you want to write three sequels? After approximately a nanosecond of soul-searching consideration, I hardly agreed. It was only later that I began to realize what a huge undertaking it would be. Other writers beside myself and Timothy Zahn are writing further adventures in the Star Wars universe, all of which will, be, will begin regularly appearing in your bookstore. Kathy Tyers tells the story of rebel and imperial troops forced into an uneasy alliance against an even greater alien threat. Dave Wolterman... Wolverton shows us Han Solo's complicated courtship of Princess Leia. My own trilogy tells the story of Luke's attempts to reestablish the Order of Jedi Knights, founding a Jedi Academy of self-discovery and training. Star Wars is not set up to be told as a Planet of the Week episodic series. Each installment changes the characters and the galactic situation in the overall saga. The Star Wars universe is complex and vast and internally consistent, and we authors have to keep it that way. In one of my previous novels with Doug Beeson, The Trinity Paradox, about an anti-nuke protester traveling back in time to sabotage the first atomic bomb, I did an enormous amount of research on the Manhattan Project in World War II, but the attention to detail and the research I have had to do for these Star Wars novels is incredibly more complex. For months, my office has been plied with scripts, reference books, novelizations, young adult adventures, just about everything that has ever been published about the Star Wars universe, including exhaustive role-playing supplements from West End Games. The details established in the films are clear-cut and obvious to follow. A bigger problem comes along when we authors need to be consistent with each other. Since we are writing most of these novels concurrently, we have to be fully aware of the other developing stories even though our novels are set in different time frames. Lucy Wilson at Lucasfilm has been our primary contact and conduit of information, offering her own suggestions and helping to keep the stories unified. She's told us that we don't necessarily have to refer to everything that happens in the other writers' adventures, but we must make certain that we don't contradict anything. Since my novels take place only a year or so after Timothy Zahn's storyline, I got in touch with him to ask how he was going to wrap up his trilogy, what sort of material I was going to be left with which of his characters were still going to be around, how the situation could change. After getting those details, I went to work plotting one long storyline broken into three volumes. I produced a 30-page proposal and outline that described the Jedi Academy story in great detail, which I mailed off to Bantham and Lucasfilm. Only after did I learn of Tom Veach and Cam Kennedy's Dark Empire coming out of Dark Horse Comics. Naturally, Dark Empire takes place exactly between Timothy Zahn and my trilogies. I believe my response was something incoherent, or at least unprintable. All of a sudden, I had to factor an entire major story into what I had already plotted. 
as you read it, you will see that Dark Empire doesn't add minor things either. Just by looking at the covers of the individual issues, you can see that Tom Veach brings back not only Boba Fett, the bounty hunter, but also the Emperor himself, and Luke goes over to the dark side to be the Emperor's right-hand man just like Darth Vader. I couldn't just ignore stuff like that and pretend that it never happened, nor could I fix it with a little band-aid to my storyline. My head started to ache. What was I going to do? I had no choice but to call up this Tom Veach guy who was causing me so many problems and see how we could resolve this. Imagine my surprise when Tom turned out to be a friendly, fascinating person with a good sense of human, humor and plenty of fresh ideas. That initial telephone conversation, the first of many, lasted over an hour and a half, and we have since swapped number, numerous ideas and suggestions for each other's storylines. We agreed to work backward to set things up for me, and I changed my focus in some places to take off from events in Dark Empire. Tom and I took a personal challenge, took it as a personal challenge to make our stories mesh as true chapters in the overall Star Wars saga. Some of the changes depended only on a shift in perspective. For instance, in the very first few pages of Dark Empire, we see that the planet Coruscant, described by Timothy Zahn as the Emperor's former capital world and now used as the seat of the New Republic, has been devastated by civil warfare and abandoned. My Coruscant scenes, originally envisioned as taking place in a peaceful Washington, D.C.-style world, must now be set on a blasted battlefield, which is more interesting anyway. Similarly, in issue three of Dark Empire, Tom Veach was a huge and destructive. Tom Veach has a huge and destructive battle take place on Admiral Akbar's homeworld of Calamari. Since much of my second novel is also set there, I must describe the planet as recovering from an immense cataclysm rather than a serene water world. Things got more amusing when Tom and I learned we had each other, we had each plotting. We had each plotted our stories assuming Leia had a different number of children. Never mind how we got around to that one, but our solution added an extra storyline to Tom's script and my novels. Overall, there has been so much interplay and exchange of small details, I don't know if I could trace anything we have altered to make the pieces fit together. Of course, maybe I shouldn't be telling you all this. Star Wars fans don't want to hear that we're making this up as we go along. We want them to think that the history of the New Republic is a sweeping, coherent saga that fits tightly together. Well, rest assured that by the time these installments are published, they are part of a unified storyline told in each, other, in each of our distinctive voices from our own perspectives. When you read Dark Empire, or any of the other novels, remember that although Lucasfilm has approved them, these are our sequels, not George Lucas's. If Lucasfilm, ever, if Lucasfilm ever makes films that take place after Return of the Jedi, they will be George Lucas's own creations, probably with no connection to anything we have written. But in the meantime, enjoy these graphic stories, read the, read the novels of Timothy Zahn, Kathy Tears, Dave Wolverton, and myself. Star Wars is a big universe, and a small word, and a small world, after all. Kevin J. Anderson Star Wars Dark Empire Trade Back trade paperback acknowledgements. Since this project was first conceived in 1988, a number of people have helped it along. Some, of, some, in their professional capacity, offered ideas that influenced the shape of the story. Others, as devout Star Wars fans, remind us of many details from the films. <clears throat> We'd like to thank these friends, one and all. Lucy Autry Wilson, Archie Goodwin, Mark McLaurin, Barbara Kessel, Bill Slavisek, Bill Smith, Todd Bliss, Skip Seotovich, Kevin J. Anderson, and Michael Horn. Last and first, we'd like to thank George Lucas for proving that the ancient power of imagination still lives. Tom Beach and Cam Kennedy. Star Wars Dark Empire Hardcover, 1993, Tip and Plate by Cam Kennedy. Star Wars Heroes of the Alliance print, 1995, by Dave Dorman, based on his cover for Star Wars Dark Empire No. 1. Star Wars Dark Empire No. 1, Wizard Ace Edition, 1997 cover, created by overlaying Dave Dorman's Heroes of the Alliance art on a new background featuring the Emperor. Star Wars Dark Empire No. 1, Wizard Ace Edition, 1997, inner cover by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 2, unused cover by Dave Dorman. 
Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 3, page 1, pencils by Ken Kennedy. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 3, page 2, pencils by Ken Kennedy. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, page number 3, pages 4, 6, and 8, 10, 4, 6 through 8, and 10, pencil excerpts by Ken Kennedy. Star Wars Dark Empire 2 Trade Paperback, 1st Edition, 1995, cover by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2 Trade Paperback, 2nd Edition, 2006, cover by Sunio Sanda. Star Wars Dark Empire 2 Trade Paperback, Forward by Ralph McQuarrie. Since I am, aside from the vision in the mind of George Lucas, the first person to see Darth Vader, a lightsaber, R2-D2, and many other characters and things that make up Star Wars' world, I've decided to write this forward. I've had to think it over because outside of that fact, my qualifications are sketchy. I cannot pontificate on theory relating to the art of sequel images or anything profound. I'm certain Cam Kennedy or any number of people would have read the script I read and listened to George talk about what he wanted to see, then gone ahead and designed these things as well or better. But since I was the one there at the time, and I'd done a few things that could be called science fiction or fantasy art, I became the first Star Wars artist. That was in December 1974, 20 years ago. And, after all this time, I'm still doing Star Wars illustrations, albeit after a long period of not doing Star Wars illustrations. It's just as interesting to me now as it was then, more so in a way. Rick McCollum, who will be producer on the next Star Wars trilogy, has talked to me about maybe doing some work on it. I've been thinking about what I would say if this came up, and I had to admit to myself that the work I'd done on Star Wars was the best I'd done. Second, I'd have the most fun doing it. So there wasn't much question about saying I'd like to work with Rick. There is one thing out there, though, that has always haunted me. It gets back to the question, what have you got to say, Ralph? I've always worked on someone else's project, making their idea work if I can. I had my ideas, it's true, but I've always thought that to be a real artist, one has to originate one's own project and carry it through. That's why I'm full of admiration for the work of Moebus, Ken Stesey, and many others in that category. I haven't been an avid collector of comics and science fiction or fantasy art, but I've seen quite a lot, and I'll say the work in the Dark Empire series is very impressive. I look with envy at the crisp, stylized drawings of Cam Kennedy, the rich color and painterly effects Dave Dorman gets into his work. In my own work, my approach has mainly been to simply make things look the way I'd like to see them on screen. I've shied away from attempts to achieve style. Perhaps I'm just a bit timid afraid of efforts which would only produce what would seem to be affectations of some sort. Style must just happen, it seems to me. Where does one look for one's own style? It's great to see it when it's there, though, and it certainly is there in the Dark Empire pages. Ralph McCory. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, hardcover, 1995, tip and plate by Cam Kennedy. Star Wars Boba Fett print, 1995, by Dave Dorman, based on his cover art, based on his cover for Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 2. Star Wars Dark Empire, The Collector's Edition, audiobook, 1995, art by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire, number 1 through 3, cover sketches by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire, number 4 through 6, cover sketches by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire, number 6, unused cover detail by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 1, cover sketch by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 2, cover sketches by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire number 2, unused cover sketch by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 3, cover sketch by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 4 through 5, cover sketches by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 5, cover sketch by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Dark Empire 2, number 6, unused cover detail by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Empire's End, number 1 through 2, cover sketches by Dave Dorman. Hero, Illustration, Hero Illustrated, number 26, 1995, cover by Dave Dorman. Star Wars Galaxy Magazine, number 8, 1996, cover by Cam Kennedy. Star Wars The Comic Companion, 2005, cover by Tsuneo Sanda. Thank you all for tuning in. We invite you to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click the bell to get notified about our next video. Until the Infernal Brotherhood convenes again, my fellow scruffy-looking nerf herders, may the Force be with you.